participate in person or by electronic means. If a council member attending by electronic means lose connection during the voting process, team members are available to get you back online quickly while the voting process is suspended. The team member contact information has been circulated to you. Video of council member speaking, presentation, and the vote results will be projected on live stream when available. Council members participating virtually are reminded that in accordance with section 14 of the procedure bylaw, members must enable the, their video to confirm quorum. Any council member whose video is disabled will be marked as, uh, as absent for the portion of that meeting. Any comments on agenda items can be sent to council using web form on city website. The link to that form will be tweeted out on at Van City Clerk. I also want to note City of Vancouver's long-standing commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, including almost uh, respect for all genders. I uh, I'm remind uh, council that when addressing speakers and team members, we avoid using gender honorifics and we will instead refer to the person by first and last name, roles, and title. We acknowledge we are on the unsedated homelands of Musqueam, Squamish, and Slaiswatu's people. We thank them for having uh, care of this land and look forward to working with them in partnership as we continue to build this great city together. I also want to take a moment to recognize the immense contribution of the city's Vancouver's team members who work hard every day to make our city an incredible place to live, work, and play. In case of an emergency where we need to evacuate the building, I would like to direct your attention to the exits. There are two exits beyond the glass door um, to the left. If these exits are obst obstructed, please direct your attention to the four exits in this chamber. Please use stairs, do not use elevator. I would like also uh, highlight that uh, there is a defibrillator uh, located at the end of the hallway outside the outside of the chamber uh, council chamber. Clerk, may we have the roll call, please? Mayor Sim, Councillor Carr, Councillor Kirby Young, present. Councillor Dominato is on a leave of absence for civic business. Councillor Bly on a leave of absence for civic business. Councillor Boyle. And here, Councillor Fry, Councillor Montague, Councillor Classen, Councillor Meisner. Present. Uh, and Councillor Joe in the chair. You have quorum, Vice Chair Joe. Thank you, Clerk. Uh, the first item of the day, I will now invite Mayor to read the proclamations uh, for the uh, International Women's Day at today's Standing Committee meeting. All right, happy International Women's Day, everyone. Yay, whoo! Uh, uh, it is my pleasure to be celebrating the 112th anniversary of International Women's Day. Yes, it was 112 years ago 
uh, that the first International Women's Day was observed in 1911. Now that day, more than uh, one million women and men showed their support by participating in public events. In the years that followed, other countries began to observe and celebrate uh, this day and the United Nations recognized it in 1975. Now, International Women's Day is an important day marked around the world by those who believe in gender equity and who seek to improve the lives of women and girls. Two-spirit, trans, non-binary, and gender diverse peoples uh, through cultural, legal, economic, and social change. This day also marks a call to action for gender equity today and every day. And um, it is now time to read the 2023 International Women's Day Proclamation, um, but before th I do that. I'm actually going to share some of my personal experiences uh, in my journey. Um, I grew up in a household uh, where I actually didn't get along with my brother very much, uh, but I had three sisters and they were absolutely amazing. And so uh, my lived experiences uh, with my sisters and growing up um, was absolutely amazing. And uh, um, at the risk of um, uh, generalizing here, um, I can tell you, uh, I truly believe. Um, that women um, make incredible, incredible leaders. It's been my journey, my uh, my personal experience uh, uh, that the, the women I've been around are way better communicators and they're way more empathetic. And then in the organizations I've been involved with, uh, uh, we have women leaders, uh, basically most of our leadership teams in both of the organizations I've been involved with um, are women-led and um you know, so when we celebrate International Women's Day, part of it, I believe, is like there's a lot of things that we need to do uh, to catch up and promote equity. But the other side of it is, make no mistake about it, this is something um, that our communities and our countries and the world benefit from by actually acknowledging it and celebrating it and really leaning into it. And so I just wanted to share that. And um, now I think it's time to read the proclamation. and. Uh, with that, can I actually get everyone up here as well? Because we are one big team. Sarah, would you like to uh, read the proclamation? Sure. sure. Good morning, everybody. Uh, for International Women's Day is celebrated around the world by those who believe in gender equity and who seek to improve the lives of women and girls, two-spirit, trans, non-binary, and gender diverse peoples through cultural, legal, economic, and social change. And whereas today is a celebration of the contributions that all women and people of marginalized genders make to our city as activists, workers, artists, professionals, entrepreneurs, caregivers, educators, volunteers, and leaders. And whereas colonization and racialized violence are intrinsically connected to gender inequalities experienced by Indigenous people, Black people, and people of color. And whereas people of marginalized genders may experience intersecting forms of oppression that impact their ability to thrive and to access employment, justice, healthcare, housing, education, and reproductive rights. And whereas International Women's Day is an opportunity to honor, support, and celebrate the progress made to advance gender equity all while recommitting to continuing to progress. Whereas women's rights affect us all, and it does begin with equity. Equity means each group or individual is given what they need based on their circumstances in order to succeed. Equality means each group or individual is given the same opportunities, regardless of their needs and circumstances. However, the goal of equity is to change structural and systemic barriers that hinder people's ability to thrive. Equal opportunities are no longer enough. And whereas the City of Vancouver is committed to promoting equity and justice and will always work to address the systemic and structural oppressions that perpetuate inequality. Read the last part. Ken, as mayor. Oh, now, there, uh, now therefore, I, Ken Samira of the City of Vancouver, on behalf of, uh, um, on behalf of Vancouver City Council, so all of us up here, do hereby proclaim Wednesday, March the 8th, 2023, as the 112th International Women's Day in the City of Vancouver. Should we go up there and hand it over here?
Okay, thanks everyone. Yeah, so I want to echo what Mayor and um, uh, Councilor Kerbyan said. So, you know, if there's one person I, I'm really feeling guilty to, that is my wife. You know, seeing what, what my wife gave birth to my baby, seeing my wife sacrifice and taking care of the whole family. You know, I'm really feeling that uh, women's um, incredible in this world and they, they deserve a huge respect for everyone. Yeah, thanks everyone. Okay, so let's continue with our meeting. Uh, okay, so this is our plan for the day. We have five reports on today's agenda. We will recess for lunch at noon and reconvene at 2 p.m. after the in-camera meeting. Should the business not be complete prior to 5 p.m. today, we will recess at, for dinner at 5 p.m. and reconvene at 6 p.m. Should the business not be complete this evening, a meeting will be reconvened on March 9, 2023 at 3 p.m. Finally, I would like to remind council members that uh, if amendments are brought forward, they must be submitted to the city clerk in final written form before the council member introduce them. Please ensure the clerk has received your amendment by using the council meeting amendments dash DL. Before we begin, I would like to remind, remind speakers that uh, they have five minutes to make their comments should stay whether they are in uh, support or in opposition of the rec recommendations and may only speak once. Committee member may have, to, uh, may have up to three minutes to ask questions to speakers. However, speakers are under no obligation to respond. I will also ask if speakers are residents in Vancouver and if it is not noted on the speaker's list. Following the last speaker on the speaker's list for each item, we will go back through the list for those who were, in, uh, who were not present when their name was initially called. Uh, as, the, as the chair of this meeting, I'm uh, suggesting that uh, the reports with no speakers, we adopt the recommendations collectively in a single mo motion. So for today's item, report 224 have no speakers. Number two, 1193 Granville Street, Cote Tea Restaurant, Cote Tea Restaurant due lessons, uh, liquor primary lessons application, liquor's uh, uh, establishment, class two. Number three, 1202 uh, David Street, Hamburger Mary David Limit, uh, Mar Mary's on Davis due lessons, liquor primary lessons application, liquor's refreshment, class two. Number four, contract award for a uh, pre qualified contractor for landfill gas work program. Does any member wish to hold uh, report 224 for debate or question to team members? Okay, seeing no. Does any member... Oh, sorry. So, Councillor Kirby, um, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I told uh, item four. Okay, thank you. Number four. Thank you. So, does any member wish to declare conflict of interest on the consent items? Councillor Montague, please go ahead. Uh, yes, Chair. Uh, item number four, I have a, uh, a conflict with one of the shortlisted companies in the report. So I'll, when it goes to debate, I'll recuse myself from that debate. Thank you. Uh, we need a motion to adopt recommendations in report two and the three. Okay. Moved by Councillor Carr, and we need a seconder. Oh, no second, it's a standing committee, that's right, yeah, thank you. So all those in favor say yeah? Opposed say nay? Okay, so the motion carries. The following items has been approved on consent. Number two, uh, 1193 Granville Street, Coty Restaurant Limit, Coty Restaurant Due Lessons, Liquor Primary Lessons Application, Liquor Establishment, Class 2. Number three, 1202 David Street, Hamburger Mary L David Limit, uh, Mary's on David due lessons, liquor primary lessons application, liquor uh, establishment, class two. Okay, so now we're going to go to the uh, agenda items. Number, uh, the first one, so our first item on agenda is 901 Granville Street, Cinema Public House Limit, Cinema Restaurant due lessons, liquor primary lessons application, liquor establish establishment, class two. Does any member wish to declare conflict of interest on this item? Okay, seeing none, we have uh, Sarah Hicks, 
chief license inspector here in the chamber to answer questions. So, councils, you have five minutes to ask questions of team members. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing no other questions, we will now hear from the registered speakers for these items. Uh, first speaker is Bert Hick. Are you on the line? Oh, are you, you're in person. Yeah. Hi, Bert. Thanks for coming to the uh, council. Good morning. Um, happy International Women's Day, Your Worship, Mr. Chairman, members of council. I'm here to speak on behalf of this application. Indeed, I was contacted by city staff asking me to stand down, but I needed to speak to you about one aspect of this application. And let's go back to the Donnelly Group who owned the cinema pub. I've worked when I used to be general manager of the Liquor Troll Licensing Branch in Victoria back in the 80s. I still remember working with Jeff Donnelly and his father on some licensing we did over there in Victoria for them. So I fully support the application. But I'm here asking for two miracles. Miracle number one is on page two of the administrative report uh, prepared by Sarah and her staff, who do a great job, by the way, um, it states that under the city policy for dual licenses, <clears throat> that the council, uh, that only existing license, food primary license establishments can qualify to become a dual license establishment. And secondly, it's restricted to only class one and class two size establishments. That's up to 150 seats. I'd like to request as miracle number one that the city amend that policy so if a new restaurant is opening, they could apply right at the get-go to be a dual licensed establishment. You want to open with what you're going to be. It's like a politician who runs on a platform and gets into office and can't work on his platform. So my view is let, this, let them breathe some air into this thing and allow it to be other establishments than one that has been in existence for, uh, as a food, food primary license. Otherwise, you're tying them down for a year. These applications that are before you today probably started with your bureaucracy about a year ago. And you're going to have a couple coming up in a few weeks' time for a few other establishments for dual license. And they were submitted to your city about a year ago. Um, I, you know, the, uh, and uh, we talked about some of them a year ago just to get the permission for dual licensing. But it's finally, they're bubbling up to your level. And so you want to open what you're going to be. So suppose you're a new hotel and you want to open with a 200-person capacity, 300-person capacity restaurant. But at evening time, because of labor shortages and the hospitality industry is still fragile, you want to be able to cut back your, your food service to a very limited menu, cut back your staffing, make it more of a cocktail culture. You won't be able to do that until after a year or so from the opening of your restaurant. So miracle number one, get rid of the, the words it has to be an existing food primary licensed establishment in terms of being eligible. Number two, and miracle number two, and we talked about this a year ago, is this policy that you have on the, uh, uh, regarding the distancing and size of, of establishments, it's antiquated. It goes back to 2000, prior to 2005, and it doesn't work. And I spoke to council about this last year. I had some choice words about it, but I'm not going to say those words again, but they're on the record. It's antiquated, and no other city in the world has this policy. It basically says that I have a 65-seat pub. Councillor Fry cannot put a, not, create his vision of having a 65-seat bar within close proximity of mine. No other city has this policy, but it still exists. But it still also carries over to what we're talking about here, dual licensing, where they refer to the fact you have to be either a class one or a class two to be eligible to get a dual license. So let's say you are, again, a hotel, and you want to have a dual license, and your food primary is larger than a class two, 
um, that over that, you're going to have to be restricted in size. And it doesn't work. Abolish the policy. Put in the trash. You know, I, I, when I'm thinking about this thing, I think of that movie Top Gun Maverick, where he just takes the manual, throws it in the garbage can. That's what you got to do. Just trash the policy. And we talked about it about a year ago, but it still exists. I understand work is underway to bring forward a recommendation, but in the meantime, there's some people who are working on applications, working on projects in the city that are very exciting and consistent with what you want to do with Granville Street and other areas, but they are, they're caught when we look at all the analysis by these policies. That's my speech. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. Yeah, uh, you do have some questions. So, okay, first question, Councillor Carbiel. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and good morning, Bert. Um, I always appreciate your kind of direct line of sight into the reality um, of what's going on. So just to be really clear, you're not opposing this specific application for Cinema Public House this morning? Well, fully support it. You're just using this as an opportunity to highlight the broader issues that if you're yeah. already in the pool and you're one of those favored folks, great, but if you're a new person, you're not going to benefit. No, I'm not, in fa I'm not opposed to it at all. And indeed, I think they were going to have about five or six speakers and then they were all stood down. But I said, I want to come and talk to you about this problem that we have. Okay. Um, and then, so if you're drawing attention to the issue with the broader policy um, and the limitations it has, like, what, can you kind of give us a bit of color on what that means? I know you talked about the hotel example, but in terms of um, new entrants coming to the hospitality industry or um, yeah. what, what does it really mean in terms of limited potential in the city? Well, in the 800 block of Granville Street, Cineplex Entertainment out of Toronto are building this massive complex. They're already into it for over $30 million. It's going to be a food primary license establishment, but they would like to have the ability to convert to being a liquor primary later at night, a dual license, um, because they just recognize that after 10 o'clock at night on Granville Street, there aren't many minors and not families. And, uh, but what this policy means is they're gonna have to open as a food primary license first and then wait a year to get the, apply for the liquor primary license to become a dual license. And that's gonna be over 150 seat person capacity throughout the different levels of this complex. And this project is totally aligned with what you're trying to do on Granville Street with the re revisioning of Granville Street and the, and the revitalization of the Granville Street Entertainment District. And um, how, so, mu how much of this policy do you think sits uh, sort of at the, at the feet of or directly squarely within the city's ability and how much uh, is provincial with the provincial, provincial guidelines and are you advocating there also? policy is, pr is pretty well provincial, a city, it's okay. all city. So this is not we have to go through the provincial process, but they wait till they get a resolution council. Just like today, the resolution you're approving today for these three applications, they, uh, they will be forwarded to the liquor branch, and if you've approved them, they will essentially uh, approve them within a few weeks. So I'm reminded, and if you recall, when we um, last council term, we uh, aligned the fire codes, because Vancouver had its own specific fire codes that limited the number of patrons yeah. in our establishments, and it was lower than the province, which meant that you could run a bar in Burnaby and have more people in it than running the same size capacity, uh, facility in Vancouver. Yeah. So is this sort of a similar approach that Vancouver has the ability to um, modernize this, if you will? Yeah, the move to, to change the, uh, the requirements under the fire code or the building, by, uh, the building by law was a good move. And the province just takes whatever capacity your fire officials give and rubber stamps and puts it on the face of the liquor license. That was a very progressive move. Sorry, Bert, you are running out of time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Kirby. But you do have other questions. Uh, Councillor Fry, please go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Bert. Nice to see you. Um, so, uh, I... And to your second wish, uh, staff, we, I know staff are coming back in Q4 with uh, further work on the on the distancing and, and totally hear you and it does seem yeah. that it needs a lot of work and not just in the downtown area but the entire city of Vancouver. I'm hearing from yeah. other constituents that are having challenges with the the sort of nature of dual license, or of, sorry, of uh, distancing bylaws. But on the dual licensing, and I'm just refreshing myself on the, because as you know, I, I brought that forward. Yeah. Oh, yeah, appreciate your leadership. The industry does. Well, well, thank you for that. But you know, isn't isn't the, the premise of dual licensing that you need to have the food primary license in place before you can apply for yeah the the, the liquor primary at the without changing the makeup and 
That was the premises of the time, but I'm saying that if someone's got a valid application for a food primary license to be a food primary license, why can't they be both issued at the same time? Right, but it Just like when we license a hotel today, uh, or when we license Rogers Arena as an example, uh, it's got both food primary and liquor primary licenses in it. Both were issued at the same time, so the whole place opens in simultaneously. Okay, so this isn't a bottleneck in the in the, the liquor control and licensing regulation. This is yeah, it's a, it's a, they can they can easily program it so it opens at the same time. So it's 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 totally fine within yeah. the, the provincial yeah. context. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, and just speaking from a, a, a practical, because I think the one thing that gets lost in this conversation is 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 how a dual license really doesn't change the layout of of the the, the premise, and in fact, it might actually contribute to more responsible consumption because you have table service, they can keep a tab on you and make sure that you're not being overserved like you might in a larger club, for instance. Is that sort of one of the... Yeah, that's correct. It's basically, well, I think we've all been to Joe Forte's. They would not change the layout at all. It would just be the same establishment, same layout. The one area where we are having a debate with the province right now is in the province of British Columbia. Food primary license establishments are not allowed to have games, like a billiard table. You go to Toronto, you go into a restaurant, yeah, you can order your meal, then go over and shoot up some pool, throw some darts, then go back and sit down and have your burger. But in BC, you can't do that. So some dual license establishments, particularly karaoke places, they run in that, we have that challenge with the problems. That's a provincial issue. You've got enough on your plate. All right. Thanks, Bert. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Fry. So one more question. Mayor Sim, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Bert, great seeing you again. Uh, just in the, um, the, spirit of, the spirit of expediency, would you be able to, um, you know, print out the, uh, the dual license uh, uh, regulations and the antiquated uh, seed policy. Would you be able to blackline it um, and send it to us? That way we can just yep. look at it and if it makes sense to... Be done this afternoon. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Hey, so there's no other questions. Thank you, Bert. Thank you for speaking at uh, Council. Uh, I think we only have one speaker, so that means this is end of our speaker's list. Uh, would someone like to move a motion? Moved by Councillor Kirby Young. And is there any discussion, Council? Okay, so there is, oh, Councillor Kirby Young, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I think that um, as we have these applications come forward, it's Uh, to hear, I think when these applications come forward, it's always an opportunity for council to hear directly from people, businesses that are living real experiences in the field. And I know when Councillor Fry brought this forward, one of the really compelling rationales is that we have incredibly expensive real estate and leases in the city. And so if you have the ability, you know, you think about being a coffee shop during the day, um, and potentially you can um, have some cocktails at night and pretend maybe have some live music going on because we have a shortage of live music venues. But it's really about using that real estate effect effectively when people are dealing with extremely expensive rents and lease costs. Um, and it only makes sense, I think, in a city like ours. So um, I appreciate the fact that uh, we have these real life case studies, if you will, uh, that point out how our regulations are sometimes antiquated. And I know that there's always lots of discussion when it comes to liquor policy um, uh, with Coastal Health and other partners. But I, I do think that there's a lot of room for modernization here. I'm happy to see this individual one coming forward, but I'd like to see us um, sort of attack this on a policy basis as opposed to having to deal with these individual um, cases that have to kind of go through this long and um, sometimes timely or costly process in order to get to an outcome. Um, and it ranges from an existing business to what we heard from one of our speakers when somebody's trying to put a business plan together to bring uh, a new business and invest in something um, as significant as the Cineplex sort of rec room concept into Granville Street where we desperately need investment to bring life and vital vitality back to that street. So um, I really appreciate the perspective that we've heard from the speaker this morning, um, but obviously we'll support this one. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Kirby. Seeing no other comments from councils, so I think I'm gonna go in, I'm going to call the vote. But remember that um, uh, council members whose video is disabled will be marked as absent for the vote uh, to section 14.13 of the procedure bylaw. Uh, clerk, can you take us to the voting screen? Council, please register your vote on the voting panel.
Okay, so the motion carries uh, unanimously with Councillor Dominado, Councillor Bly, and Councillor Boyle absent. Thank you, everyone. So that concludes item one on the agenda. Okay, so the next item, I guess, is, will be number four. Uh, it's contract award to pre-qualify the contractor for landfill gas works program. So Councillor uh, Montague has declared the conflict of interest on this item. So here we have uh, Alexander Roth, uh, Director of Supply Chain Management here in Chamber, to answer questions. Council, you have up to five minutes to ask questions of team members. Are there any questions? Councilor Kirby? That's the previous one, right? Okay. Okay. Here we go. Can I get my timer reset? Thanks. Uh, yeah. Oh, you know what? Restart. Oh, sorry. Okay, you are good to go. Okay, super. Thanks. Uh, good morning. Um, I pulled this report because um, I appreciate uh, sort of the the opportunity for operational efficiencies, but um, I'm asking a question in the context of whether or not this would be precedent setting because council is being asked in this particular case to approve a spend of $13 million, which is significant. Um, and the report states uh, that it would not come back to either council again or bid committee, whereas typically contracts over $2 million do. Um, and I can appreciate that we're approving a funding envelope, but I wonder if you can speak to um, whether or not this is setting precedent in a time when we have had a historically um, unprecedented tax increase, we're dealing with inflationary pressures, it's really important that we're fiscally responsible, and yet we're being asked to kind of sign off on $13 million and nothing's coming back to us with any line of sight around those contracts during this period of time. Thank you. Alexander Ralph, Chief Procurement Officer and Director of Supply Chain Management. Through the Chair, thanks, Councillor Kirby Young, for your question. Uh, we're not setting a precedent. We actually do this with other contracts already. We have pre-qualified uh, vendors, and we have come to Council to be able to ask for a, a larger envelope uh, and then um, actually do uh, the approval of those, uh, which are sometimes above $2 million. Uh, uh, outside of our regular procurement policy. Uh, we do this, for example, with our citywide construction contract, um, where uh, we have, uh, I think in that case, it was approved a $60 million envelope, and we are doing individual procurements uh, um, based on rules of engagement that we have set for that specific pre-qualification. Okay, so just to be clear, because I know we have had pre-qualified vendors uh, and funding envelopes before, but I, I just want to be clear, so you're saying that neither that in, in those previous pre-approvals, they also waived bid committee and council approval? That is correct. So that's uh, in the same uh, fashion. We came to council and asked for that exception of the procurement policy, and it was approved. And in this case, we're asking for the same exception. Okay. And what is oh, sorry. the... Sorry, uh, Councillor, if I may, just to clarify a point I heard you make there, that, that we're not waiving bid committee approval. Um, these, these contracts will go through bid committee. Um, they just wouldn't come back to council. So the, the other thing to notice is that these can, are, I, can I just interject yeah. here because I have limited time. On page three, it says the team will not be seeking bid committee or council approval in paragraph one on page three. Sorry, that I may be. And, and this is correct. What we're seeking is to be able to delegate that authority to the general manager of engineering services and to the chief procurement officer to be able to award contracts under this pre-qualification and as well to be able to sign the contracts. So I don't know if the city manager wants to follow up because that's the crux I'm, of my I'm question. incorrect. That's, I'll defer to Alex. I, I think the other point to note here, and, and it's an excellent question, is that these contracts would be um, tendered. So, so they will be awarded to the lowest bid. Um, so the, it's, it's going to be straightforward, I think, in terms of the award. That's one of the reasons why um, we're proposing this approach, that these will all be low, based on the, the pool of pre-qualified contractors, they'll be awarded to the lowest bids. So we'll be able to demonstrate very clearly and happy to report back to council on those contract awards. We do provide an annual report, um, but I think the transparency around those contracts is something we can certainly assure as well. Okay, thank you. And then maybe my, just the last follow-up then uh, to Alex is just, so what is the, put another way, what is the benefit to residents and to the city in taking this approach? 
Yeah, so we're trying to create these programs to be able to generate efficiencies and to be able to speed up uh, our delivery of our capital plan. So by coming to council uh, for every project, uh, it takes time to be able to actually get those approvals. So what we're doing is making sure that we um, delegate that authority so that we can speed up the approval process uh, with, as uh, the city manager was describing, uh, this is low risk because it's just price based or we're doing ITTs for these pre-qualifications. So therefore, uh, we will be shrinking the actual uh, time to be able to sign a contract uh, and to be able to award the contract. Okay, super. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Councillor Carbiel. Uh, Councillor Carr, you have the floor. Um, uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, I also had questions similar to Councillor Kirby Young. Um, uh, there is a, an oversight element uh, in terms of public oversight on the awarding of contracts over $2 million. How much time do you believe? Well, first of all, how much time does it take uh, to go through the regular process where Council does have oversight over those um, over $2 million uh, processes versus what you expect to save in time? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Carr. Uh, it normally takes us around six weeks to be able to uh, go through the approval process since we prepare a report uh, and then uh, being able to schedule it. Um, normally, uh, council agendas are oversubscribed and sometimes we actually do need to wait for the next council agenda to be able to uh, award the contract. Okay. Um, six weeks. And, and uh, how much time do you think that'll save? You'll just, if you don't go through a council agenda and council approval? Yeah, so we, we estimate that uh, the, for these $13 million, uh, um, there'll be probably, um, is it like three or four? Yeah, so we will normally save like 2% in terms of time by just going through this process. Okay. Okay, and I just have one other question because I didn't understand one of the um, points that was raised on page two of this report. What are utility strikes of gas collection pipes? Yes, and we have Lynn Belanger from our uh, landfill on the line, and maybe she can describe um, just uh, the issues that we've been having with uh, some of the of the vendors. Hi, uh, thank you, Alex, and uh, Councillor and Chair. Hopefully, you can hear me well enough. Yep. Okay, thank you, and thank you for your question. Um, so, this report is um, to pre-qualify for uh, gas contractors for the landfill, and that work, um, just to address uh, some of the earlier comments first, is um, definitely dependent on the fill progression of the landfill. And so as we're filling the landfill, we fill it like a layer of cake, and um, the garbage is the uh, cake and the dirt is the icing. And so as we're filling those, we're installing gas works, and to not have the contractor have to dig too deep. We need to time that well perfectly. It's, it takes a lot of coordination to predict where the fill will be so that we can have that gas works um, progress at the time we need it to progress. So the savings that we're talking about here may seem insignificant, um, but they are actually very critical in terms of getting our contractors on the ground. Um, and then to the question of utility strikes. And um, so all of these gas works are all in the ground. They're connecting to existing gas works that we have to increase our gas collection efficiency to meet provincial targets. And through that work and those connections um, and the excavations that have to happen to install and connect, um, other works can be hit um, and struck. And so typically that's other gas works. All of that is under vacuum. And so there's not any release um, um, to anyone, but because it is under vacuum, it introduces oxygen into our system and it shuts down our system. Um, our flare system and so we're not able to and we have to report that to the province so we're not able to um, to continue to collect gas when that happens and so we want to avoid those utility strikes as much as possible and that's through um, a, a great safety culture with the the company and through the years of experience that they have here at the landfill. Okay so this is not people striking this is like uh, excavators striking the pipes. That's right. Caught it. Okay that's it for my questions. Thank you Councillor Kerr. Uh, seeing no other question from the council, so would like will someone like to move a motion? Moved by Councillor Kirby Young. Uh, we don't need a second for a standing committee. 
Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I'm just, I just said. So, Council, is there any discussion? Councilor Carr, please go yeah. ahead. Um, yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm not prepared to support this. Um, and the reason I'm not prepared to support it is, um, uh, you know, a 2% saving in time to not go through the uh, council and public um, uh, um, transparency of the larger contracts for the city, I think is not worth it. I really do believe that um, um, that on larger contracts, it's worth having um, the public able to know about it, uh, um, council able to discuss it, the media able to cover it if they so wish. Uh, and so um, it's, uh, to me, uh, worthwhile in, in sort of the spirit of a good uh, democratic process uh, to maintain the current process. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Councillor Kirbyam. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And I'm just going to ask a point of uh, clarification, if I'm permitted to at this point, through you to staff. And I heard, I believe it was a 2% savings in cost, not in time. Is that correct? I wonder if staff can clarify. I thought that's what I heard. That's correct. It's cost. That is correct? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so I pulled this report because I do think it's important to do the due diligence um, and to ask these questions because $13 million is a lot of money for taxpayers. It's one and a half percent equivalent in property tax, and it is our job to provide uh, due diligence and oversight for the city's finances, uh, which are paid through uh, for through hardworking people and their property tax dollars. Um, having said that, it's my job to ask the questions and then to um, distill and make a judgment on the information that I've heard. And a 2% savings on $13 million is important and it is significant as we try to show that we are good stewards and we are looking for those appropriate efficiencies and this is one of those opportunities i think for efficiencies as we continue to kind of work to mitigate some of those tax increases and some of the inflationary pressures and other things that we're seeing and if this provides this is a it's fairly routine, I think, in terms of the gas works thing. This is not a new $13 million expenditure that we don't have a history um, of, of not procuring year after year after year and a very fundamental core service to the city. Um, and so I think given that uh, track record and recognizing, I think, there's that expertise in the engineering department who have gone through this process, uh, you know, well before we got here and will continue well after us, I am prepared to support it, but I do feel... Uh, I am appreciative of staff providing the context and answering the questions because I think that's important for council to understand. I think it's important for the public to understand why we're doing this because we're doing it to actually try to be more cost effective and more efficient. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carbion. Councillor Carr. Um, if I could ask a point of information through you, Chair. Um, so to staff, um, I asked the question of how long um, it would take to go through the approval process if it came to council, how much time would be saved. I was told six weeks to go through the approval process, and then I asked how much time would be saved, and I heard 2%. Uh, perhaps my question wasn't heard um, accurately, um, but I want to ask the question again. How much time would be saved by not going through the... the uh, council approval process. Yeah, so just to clarify, it, it would take, uh, we would save six weeks uh, uh, on each project, um, and it would save approximately 2% in cost um, by, by following this program. Okay, that wasn't accurate. I, that, I, that was confusing uh, when it was presented to me. That does change my opinion. So it saves six weeks, saves 2%. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Okay, seeing no other question from the council, now I'm going to ask to call the vote. Clerk, can you please take us to the voting screen? Council, please register your vote on the voting panel. Okay, so now we have the results. So the the uh, item carries uh, with uh, Councillor Carr up, to, up to 10. Uh, and Councillor Dominado and Councillor Bly uh, absent, and Councillor Montague declared conflict of interest. Okay, thanks everyone. That concludes item four on the agenda. We have one more item to go in this uh, standing committee. Our next item is the, on the agenda is 2023 property tax uh, developed potential relief and targeted <laughs> land assessment averaging. Does any member wish to declare conflict of interest on this item. Hey, do we want to bring Councillor Montague back? Okay, so 
we have uh, Patrice M.P., uh, General Manager of Finance Risk and Supply Chain Management here in the chamber to present this item. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, we're very pleased to be here to um, present an update on the development potential tax relief. That is uh, uh, a new opportunity for us after a great deal of time working together um, with the province uh, to address the issue that Council has brought forward uh, to us a number of years ago that we've been working towards to address uh, the impact of development potential on uh, our, our smaller independent businesses and uh, and community partners. And, and as well, we'll be talking about targeted land averaging. And this is something that the city has done uh, for many years. And so we'll bring those two together because they are interrelated as far as how we adjust um, uh, the approach on, on uh, taxes. And so I'm going to ask Grace Chang, our Director of Long-Term Financial Strategy, to provide you with a presentation. And then we're available for questions. Thank you, Patrice. Um, I'm Grace Chang, Director of Long-Term Financial Strategy. I'm going to talk about um, two programs today. So to start with, um, there will be two sets of distinct recommendations under the two programs. The first program that we're going to talk about is the Pilot Development Potential Relief Program. Um, um, so we, we're going to ask Council to consider implementing a pilot program and approve the city-specific criteria in addition to the minimum legislative criteria dictated by the province uh, according to the legislation. As well, council needs to decide on um, what the reduced tax rate would be that is applicable on the development potential. Uh, we're asking council to consider setting it at 50% of the normal blended light industry and business tax rate. And also, council needs to determine what is the percentage of the land value for those eligible properties to be subject to the lower tax rate. And because of the timing of the legislation coming to, into effect and the incomplete and at times, um, you know, some limitations on the BC assessment data, we are um, asking council to approve applying this percentage land value on a neighborhood basis and on a zoning district basis as opposed to property by property and up to $5.4 million of value to be subject to the lower rate. And finally, um, we, we're also asking council to require the eligible property owner to notify their occupiers in order to qualify for the relief. Under the Land Assessment Averaging Program, we're asking council to consider continue to apply the five-year targeted land assessment averaging to eligible hot properties within the residential class as well as light industry and business property classes. And also, like all prior years, set a threshold at 10% above the class average year-over-year -year change to define what a hot property is, and also limiting the impact and the benefit of averaging, which is the reduction in land value, up to a threshold, which is also consistent with prior years as well. And also, including properties that are impacted by city-initiated rezoning and ODP amendments, However, exclude those properties that are impacted by owner-initiated changes. This means that if property owners came to City of Vancouver asking council to increase their density or change in use, those will be excluded for consideration. And finally, according to the legislation, we need council to approve that the properties that will be benefiting from the pilot development potential relief program will be excluded and not considered under the land assessment averaging program. So just to step back a little bit, I want to talk a bit about um, the property assessment and taxation framework. Uh, the reason why it is important to understand this is because there are different factors impacting the property value um, of you know, those properties in Vancouver and in general in, in Metro Vancouver. So first and foremost, BC assessment determines the property value based on highest and best use or just market value. Um, and it's based on market data that is available by sell transactions. And they also determine what the property class would be based on the actual use of the property. And for city council, you determine the land use policy, you, you determine the zoning, the density, the, the, um, uh, uh, the type of use. And you also determine what is the total city tax levy to be collected as part of the annual budget process. As well, you um, de determine and you decide on what is the tax share between the residential and the business property classes and setting the tax rate for each of the property class. 
as well as whether you want to use um, the development potential relief as well as the land assessment averaging um, ability and authority, which is available to city council within uh, under the Vancouver Charter. So how are city tax rate determined? First and foremost, as I uh, mentioned briefly before, um, city tax rate, city tax levies are determined by council as part of the budget process. So how much city tax levy needs to be collected is purely a formula. What is the total annual budget? And then what is the non-tax revenue? The difference between the two is the total tax levy that we need to collect. And for 2023, um, the, uh, the tax levy as approved by council as part of the budget process is $1.7 billion. And then step two, council will need to determine in April, what is the tax share between residential and non-residential property classes? And back in 2022, the residential property classes are responsible for paying 57% of the total city tax levy and non-residential property classes, they are responsible for 43% of the total tax levy. And finally, um, how do we determine the tax rate? It's purely to apply council's decision on the tax share and then basically do um, uh, uh, the total tax levy divided by um, um, the assessment base for that particular property class, then we get the city tax rate, which will be reported to council in mid-May. And there's one, I would say, misconception or a myth um, you know, in the public, thinking that as long as the assessed value is going up, city, like not just Vancouver, but all other municipalities, we will get a lot of windfall profit in case it's actually not the case. So when you look at um, over the years since 1988, we have been tracking what the tax rate looked like um, all the way to 2022. And this is just to demonstrate that there is under the principle of revenue neutrality. Once council approved the total tax levy that needs to be collected through the budget process, if their assessment changes, increases or decreases, we just simply adjust the tax rate to collect exactly the same amount of tax levy that is um, determined by council and we don't get more or less money because of that. However, even though the pie is the same, the total amount of tax levy to be collected is the same, um, different properties may be impacted by their assessment changes differently. Say for example, in year one, just assume very simplistically, there are only four properties in Vancouver. Everyone is having the same assessed value. However, in year two, their assessed value started changing differently. So for properties one and four, which have a below average increase in their assessed value, they will pay lower taxes. And for properties um, two and three, because they have above um, average increase in their assessed value, then they will be paying higher taxes. But this does not change the total tax levy that the city is collecting. And this is a real, um, I would say, some trending that we want to share with council and the public. Um, when we say um, a differential assessment changes, it's impacting properties differently. So within the residential classes, we have been tracking how the uh, assessed value and, and, and the tax uh, implication um, how different are those between condos and also single family homes. As you can see, because of the, I would say, relatively outsized increase in SAS value for single family homes over the last 10 years um, or more, um, they have been showing a much higher tax increase year over year versus the condo. When you see the condo, like strata condos, in some years they were actually kind of plateau or even coming down for quite an extended period of time. So from a non-residential commercial um, a property kind of uh, perspective, on the left side of the, uh, of the slide, um, we, uh, we show a sample non-highest and best use property. And on the right hand side is a sample fully developed AAA office building. And you can also see that over the last um, couple of years, because of the highest and best use assessment methodology and the uh, and, and the rapid increase in their assessed value to reflect that, they have been shouldering an outsized burden of tax, um, uh, tax levy over the years. While um, a sample a, um, AAA office building, their tax levy has been pretty stable, if not coming down. So this is just to tell you that different properties have been experiencing different assessment changes, and then that also caused the changes in or difference in their tax bill, increase or decrease year over year. So why is it important to talk about development potential and taxation impact? Um, what is really driving the property values? Very simplistically put, supply demand for sure, um, the ultra-loose monetary policy that has been 
I mean, witnessed during the whole COVID situation and the, um, at the spike in the in the property values, that's also one of the key reasons. Of course, there will always be some level of market speculation, or maybe there are some sort of major infrastructure or amenity investment that could also contribute to us change in the assessed value. However, there's one that is quite prominent, is the land use plans that may create a higher and better use than current use. That is also driving um, assessment increases as well. So for properties that are facing the prospect of redevelopment, the market would expect a higher and better use relative to their current use. And then, it, and, and then the potential purchasers, they will begin to price in a premium over and above the value that is justified you know, by, by, by the current use. So when you look at this, it's just like very simplistically put. We use typically see, you know, there is a, a retail, a great storefront, just one level of, 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 you know, commercial property or commercial establishment. However, because of either actual land use policy or because of the perceived potential future use, um, the expectation that there could be condos built on top, even though it's not developed, the assessed value would have reflected that. And then eventually, all these will be this is actually a transitional issue. The reason for that is because um, eventually every single underdeveloped property will be developed eventually. So what we are dealing with is a transitional issue that are impacting in particular um, those tenants and occupiers of these underdeveloped properties. As I mentioned before, properties are assessed by BC assessment at highest and best use. And this, maybe it's just a fancy name. In, 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 in substance, it's just like market value that they're observing you know, in the market through the market transactions. Um, and this is in accordance with the Assessment Act. And then for all the underdeveloped properties or non highest and best use commercial properties, the unrealized development potential could result in significant property tax implications. In particular, over the last, I would say, four to five years, Council has been um, keenly um, aware of this because independent businesses, arts, culture, and nonprofit organizations, uh, most of them, they have been operating in underdeveloped and non, non highest and best use properties, in, particularly, in particular in those neighborhoods that are experiencing really fast pace of change and dramatic increases in value. And what's worse, through triple net leases, the landlords will pass on all the entire tax burden onto the tenants. That's, that, mean, uh, that means tenants, they have to pay taxes on the space that they rent and use, as well as taxes on the development potential that they don't own and they will not benefit from. And independent owners and operators as well, they're also experiencing you know, cash flow uh, challenges until they, they are ready to redevelop or sell their properties. So in the following section, I'm gonna maybe just kind of, you know, an overview of what council has been directing staff over the past five years um, to tackle this issue. Back in June 2017, um, council passed a, a motion directing staff to work with um, the province and BC assessment and other key stakeholders to address the impact of triple net leases on property tax payments for small business tenants. And there was a UBC motion back in September um, 20, um, 2018 supporting, um, that is about supporting independent small businesses through the provincial assessment and tax reform. That basically, um, uh, this specific motion is about requesting the province to initiate a province-led intergovernmental working group to address the, the assessment and taxation issues to enable the long-term viability of independent small businesses in Metro Vancouver and the rest of BC. And as a result of that, an intergovernmental working group was established in the fourth quarter in 2018 based on council's pr proposal back in February 2018 and with the support from Metro Vancouver in, in July 2018, as well as UBCM's motion, which is September 2018. So as a result of that, within that working group, we, we have, staff have been, engage, had, have, have been engaging um, you know, senior staff members from the Ministry of Municipal Fi uh, Affairs and Housing and Ministry of Finance and also BC Assessment. And various CFOs from Metro Vancouver cities, including of course Vancouver, Burnaby, Coquitlam, North Vancouver, Richmond, Surrey and West Vancouver, we all participated in that working group to work with the province to come up with something that is workable. So the key thing that we ask for is that municipalities need a tool to lower the tax rate on the development potential to support independent small businesses and community partners. The reason for that is because without any changes in the legislation, city council can only apply one tax rate for each property class and you cannot apply more than one tax rate. 
So the um, uh, and then subsequent to to those um, council motions, there has been like updates to the motion. But the most recent one was raised um, in April 2022. Again, is seeking um, uh, the, uh, is asking the mayor to write a letter to the province to address the core issue of taxes on development potential that is punitive, impacting small businesses, arts and culture, and nonprofit organizations. So that's the genesis of how long it has taken us to get to, to this stage. So um, back in 2022, the Ministry of Finance initiated the Property Assessment Str Strategic Review, um, hope, um, hope to basically you know, develop a longer term solution in time for the 2023 tax year to provide tax relief for businesses impacted by development potential. And in October 2022, um, uh, the province introduced the legislation um, and Bill 28 was finally um, enacted and also came into effect in November 2022. Bill 22 is, is very permissive in nature. It provides permissive authority to municipalities. So we have authority to, through a bylaw, to identify certain light industry and business properties to be eligible for this relief. Council can also specify the percentage of the land value for each of those eligible property to be subject to the lower tax rate. And council, of course, you will have the authority to determine what that lower tax rate would be. And then you can also require owners to provide notices to um, uh, the notice of the tax relief to the occupiers. Um, just want to reiterate that this legislation is crafted in a way that it really gives maximum flexibility to local council to, to, to determine your own um, um, eligibility criteria and the level of the tax relief that you want to provide. Or you can actually choose not to effect it as well. So basically, um, in this Bill 28, which is different from what originally uh, was recommended from the Intergovernmental Working Group, what we called as split assessment through a commercial subclass, is that for this, under this bill, BC assessment is not required to provide the development potential value on the assessment roll. As a proxy, the province um, legislated, um, you know, um, included in the legislation, legislated um, BC assessment to provide a list to municipalities that captures all the property with a land value that is greater than or equal to 95% of their total assessed value um, because with that, they consider that is, um, is underdeveloped. And this is a provincial criteria. There's nothing that local government can actually change it. So this is the minimum requirement set by the province in the legislation. And um, BC assessment, well, after generating the list, they hand it over to, to local government and local government will need to make sure that of the list, of the properties on the list, we need to find a way to make sure that those properties were in use as of October 31st of the preceding year. And there was a reason for that because the legislation was very clear. The intent is to help businesses and community partners who are impacted by, um, by the development potential. So this is not intended to, um, to provide relief to vacant land or properties that have been vacant for a while. There are no businesses you know, on, on, on the site. So this is very specific in the, in the legislation. And this is not something that local government or city council can change. It's a legislative requirement. And then municipalities will be required to impute the development potential value to inform what is the level of um, relief that we want to provide and, and which is subject to the, the lower tax rate. So how does this program work? Um, as I mentioned before, because BC assessment is not required to, um, to give local government the development potential value. However, they did share what is the available information that they have. It may not be on every single property, but whatever information that they have, they share with us. So for some of the properties, BC assessment provides us with the value of the, the current use, which is based on the income approach. And then, of course, we all know what is the highest and best use value, which is the value on the assessment role. So when we basically, um, how do we um, impute the development potential is purely to deduct um, the, current value, the current use value from the assessed value, then that is the imputed development potential value on those properties that we have information on. And then with that in mind, for, uh, for the current use value, um, council will be applying the typical standard class five and six tax rate. 
However, council will also be based on um, the imputed development potential value. Council can determine what is the proportion of that value that will be subject to the lower tax rate, and council will um, impose the lower tax rate to the portion of the land value that will be subject to the relief program. So, for the pilot program, um, I want to kind of um, just uh, reiterate again what the provincial eligibility criteria are. When we say provincial eligibility criteria, it is not something that local government can change. It's all in the legislation. So a commercial property will be eligible if it has land and improvement value in class five or six or both. It cannot be vacant, as I mentioned before, uh, as of October 31st of the preceding year. And it needs to have a combined value, land value, Ex, uh, at least or exceeding 95% of their total assessed value. A commercial property will not be eligible if it is split class, um, other than having a split class with residential, but split class with other classes, it will not be eligible. Um, as well, um, if it is exempted in whole or in part for any other, um, for, every, for any other reasons, then it will not be considered for um, this program. And most important of all, um, it cannot be also benefiting from the land assessment averaging or phasing program. And this is important why council you see today, we're, we're I would say, uh, presenting to council the two programs at, at the same time because there is some very complicated interplay between the two programs. So basically, what um, roughly in, uh, in class five and six, we have roughly, I would say, just slightly below 15,000 properties in those two classes. After applying the various um, provincial legislation and legislative uh, threshold as well as um, uh, inclusion or exclusion criteria, um, what is remaining in terms of the, uh, property um, eligible under the provincial criteria um, is roughly 3,400 properties, which, is like, which accounts for um, slightly below a third of the class five and six properties, which is a lot. So when, when staff look at the uh, BC assessments data, we notice that within the 3,400 eligible properties under the provincial criteria, roughly 1,700 of the properties, which accounts for close to $20 billion, they include properties that are owned or occupied by senior government agencies. There are big boxes, international and national chains, They're like banks, there are development pre uh, presentation centers, there are gas stations, there are parking lots, there are car dealerships and auto services, there are self-storage and warehouses, hotels, office use, and strata properties, and there are some billboards as well. And there are also uh, roughly just below 300 properties that actually have little or no development potential value. What does it really mean? Meaning that even though it has a very high proportion of their assessed value in the land value, however, when we look at their current use value, it is actually very similar to their highest and best use value. So meaning that they actually don't necessarily need relief. And then for uh, just below 50 properties, property owners, they're actually seeking additional density or change in use uh, with city council. So with that in mind, and also, basing our work on the previous uh, council, council directions to date, the pilot program is really intended to target support for independent businesses and community partners in non-highest and best use properties, particularly neighborhood retail along high streets. As such, um, what we are presenting to council is that council can consider excluding at least for the pilot program, excluding these 2,000 plus um, uh, properties from being eligible from the, the, the pilot program. If council agree with this criteria, then roughly what is remaining uh, that are uh, remaining properties that are eligible for the pilot program would be roughly um, 1,360 properties, plus or minus. And I can actually show you some of, these are some of the um, sample ineligible properties. You can actually see that they're I'm just going to call it out like BC like a store. Um, and there are some major office and shopping centers. And there are some downtown hotels. There are some um, 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 office buildings in downtown as well. Some big box stores and some banks. And when we talk about why it is important to understand the, um, the application of the program, um, the pilot program, uh, the pilot development potential relief program versus the averaging. So this is kind of like a step-by-step -step decision kind of uh, 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 approach, meaning that we need to kind of first make sure that 
properties they fulfill and they meet the provincial criteria. And after that, if council agree to the city criteria, then we need to apply that lens to look at who are eligible and who are ineligible. And then once that's done, we also need to go through a declaration process at a minimum to make sure that those eligible properties, they were in use and not vacant as of October 31st of last year. As well, we believe council may want to get um, the property owners to certify that they have already um, notified their tenants that they were indeed, um, you know, that they, they're, they're getting this relief so that the tenants is aware so that they, they can expect um, tax relief through the triple net lease as well. However, if, if any of the properties um, are found to be ineligible because it does not meet the city criteria or because it cannot declare that, you know, um, the property wasn't vacant uh, back in October 31st and that kind of thing, then we will immediately put them under the averaging program. So even though they may not be eligible for the development potential relief program, they may be eligible for the averaging program. And what we're looking at is that for the 2,000 plus properties that according to the city criteria, they will not be eligible. Um, roughly 360 of those properties are hot property and we are putting it under the land assessment averaging program so that they can get um, some relief as well. So um, in front of you is actually a map showing for different districts, um, um, the, the range of um, the land value that could potentially be under the lower tax rate. And as I mentioned before, given the assessment data limitations, um, this uh, development potential relief, which is characterized by the percentage of land value that will be subject to the lower tax rate, it is set, it, staff is setting it at the neighborhood and zoning district level as opposed to having a very customized property by property approach because that we do have limitation based on BC assessment data. And we hope that this limitation can be worked on over um, the next few years so that we can actually have more precise information. As well, when we look at um, the distribution of the land value, um, we, we look at um, some of those, um, you know, the really, the, the highest value properties. And we are recommending to council that very similar to averaging, maybe we should limit the benefit of this pilot program up to $5.4 million of of land value to be transferred and subject to lower tax, uh, the lower tax rate. So just to give um, council a sense of um, what does it look like. So as I mentioned before, staff is recommending that uh, the lower tax rate will be set at 50% of the blended class five and uh, uh, six tax rate. And also, um, we also want to kind of show council um, a sensitivity on what is the implication um, implication to the tax rate as a result of um, this level of relief. So assuming that council doesn't want to go with the $5.4 million cap, and still you agree to the 50% discount of the blended rate, it will have a 1.14% to the tax rate, meaning that everyone else have to pay 1.14% higher tax rate for that purpose. However, if you agree with the $5.4 million cap, it will reduce the implication to the tax rate by 1%, and then so on and so forth. So um, I think the key thing here that we need to understand is that this is based on, um, based on the number of properties after applying the city criteria and then impacting the tax rate and, and the amount of tax relief that needs, to be, um, th th that needs to be provided. However, if council consider that instead of applying the city, um, uh, the city criteria, just purely go with the minimum provincial criteria, um, it's not on this slide, but I can actually give you a sense. Roughly, if everyone that are eligible uh, under the provincial criteria, roughly the tax rate increase will be around at least 3.5% for this program in order to collect the same amount of levy. Uh, so it's 3.5%, including everyone that will be eligible under the provincial criteria versus the 1% for those properties that will only be, um, uh, that are eligible under the city criteria. So for the pilot program, um, the 13, uh, I'll say 1,360 eligible properties, this is roughly where they are at on the map. And just to give you some estimated city tax relief for sample properties, in Marpo, um, you know, there are like restaurants and cafes in a strip mall. We are talking about on an annual basis, $12,800 tax relief. And for a restaurant in Collingwood, we're, we're looking at roughly $7,200 tax relief. 
And for the restaurant, uh, for a re um, sorry, restaurant in Castellano, it's roughly four thousand and six hundred dollar. And just to remind um, everyone that this development potential relief program only applies to the city tax levy, and it does not apply to other taxing authorities, including the provincial school tax, as well as TransLink, Metro Vancouver, BC Assessment, and, and, and BC Municipal Finance Authority. And there are some more samples. Beaumont Studio in Mount Pleasant, the savings will be roughly $8,800. Eastside Studios, $3,600. And then um, um, and, uh, Trouble 5 Music, uh, $12,700 dollars a year. So in summary, this pilot program will roughly benefit 1,360 properties that are eligible under the city criteria, assuming council agree with the city criteria. And roughly um, between 5 to 55 percent of their assessed value will be subject to lower tax rate. However, the, ma the majority of those uh, reduction will be in the realm of 25 to 45 percent of, of the relief, but the range is a, a lot wider. And then also up to 5.4 million dollar cap. And the tax rate is going to be 50 percent lower than the normal blended class five and six tax rate, and property owners must notify their tenants of tax relief in order to qualify. And the other thing we just want to highlight is that we are we were under very tight um, time frame because we only got our completed assessment role back in January and we had roughly six weeks to get a pilot program in place. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Um, do we have enough, um, I would say, engagement with all the key stakeholders? Not a lot in terms of program design, but we have been um, updating um, our key stakeholders just basically pure, I would say, project update um, every so often so that they know that we are working hard to get something going in year 2023 assuming, uh, uh, and for, for council consideration. And also, um, cannot uh, reiterate um, uh, uh, strong enough, um, our ability and the quality of the, the data, it is, um, it is very important. And then we really need to work with BC Assessment and the province to keep um, enhancing the data quality and also completeness so that it can actually keep informing uh, cities' um, criteria and also provincial criteria as well. And the other thing is that, as I mentioned before, the interface between this pilot program and a targeted averaging is very complicated. That's why council is presented with both programs at the same time. So in conclusion, since Bill 28 came to effect in November 2022, we have been hearing from all other municipalities or a lot of other Metro Vancouver municipalities that they're very interested in considering this. However, they were concerned about the assessment data limitations and a very aggressive implementation timeline for 2023. Staff acknowledge this and we keep reiterating this. However, we have also been hearing from the key stakeholders that they do need something going this year. Hence, um, we provided council with a pilot program, starting small, keep refining and keep expanding potentially in the future. Um, and like, how can we best possible uh, how can we implement this in the best possible way to provide the much needed relief to independent businesses and community partners? As well, more importantly, is because we fully intend to work with the key stakeholders looking at the pilot program, what have we done well, what have been missing, so that in the future we can actually incorporate those enhancements in future programs as well. So that concludes the presentation on the Pilot Development Potential Relief Program. The following sections I'm going to talk about the Targeted Land Assessment Averaging Program. This, very different from the Development Potential Program, is really a tool to target the assessment volatility. What it means, by, uh, what it means uh, is that um, we engaged the Property Tax Policy Review Commission a couple years ago, and this is their suggestion. Instead of basically really um, impacting every single property, we should really identify what are the hot properties that need tax relief, and what is deemed a hot property any of the properties that have experienced an unanticipated year-over-year -year increase in assessed value, that is 10% um, higher than the class average change, then that is considered as a hot property. So if those are hot properties, um, we have been applying the five-year averaging formula to average out the, the most current five years of land value in order to dampen and also slow down the, the, the increase in the, in the taxable values, which will help with lowering the tax bill. However, for those properties that are not hot, they will not be subject to any mitigation. 
So when you look at um, the residential properties in 2023, roughly 7,570 uh, properties are deemed hot properties, which accounts for 4% of the properties. And um, they will be eligible for the land assessment averaging program for this year. And that's, um, that is actually a reduction from um, 2022 because back then, roughly 7% of the properties were, were deemed hot and were subject to land assessment averaging. And how does it work? Um, as I mentioned before, um, it's just applying the most current five years of land value and do the average of it so that you can actually kind of move um, the properties, uh, the, the reduce the taxable value increase and the number of properties uh, with a lower a lower year-over-year um, uh, -year tax increase. You just kind of bring them closer to the, to, to the threshold. And in addition to the land assessment averaging for the residential relief, there are other provincial tax relief mechanism. The one that is the most impactful is the, the Assessment Act, Section 19.8. The intent is to protect property owners uh, and primary homeowners, basically whose assessed value is really increasing because of you know, zoning changes. A good example is along Canby corridors a number of years ago, uh, because of, of city council's uh, land use policy, um, single family homes, um, they could be built up to like you know, four or six um, levels of condos, then their assessed value was impacted. However, if you're eligible um, you know, for this relief, if, you, if that is your principal resident and if you have stayed there for over 10 years, then your assessed value for the property would be based on your current use, but not the higher and, be uh, best uh, high, higher and better future use. And the second one is homeowner grant. And this one, I don't think I need to kind of explain further. Everyone understand what the homeowner grant is. And you can actually see that the majority of the, uh, of the property own, uh, the properties that are benefiting from the homeowner grant tend to be closer on the east side because there is a cap to this benefit. Um, that's why you can actually see the, you know, most are on the east side. And the last one is the property tax deferment. This is not something that is financed by the city, but it is financed by the province. So um, there are two different types of programs, but um, the, the one that, that people are most familiar with is, the, um, is for 55 years or older. And um, basically, this is the province financing the payment of the property taxes. So city of Vancouver, we will still be getting all the payment, but the homeowner will need to repay the province um, when they sell the, uh, sell the property. So after we have talk, uh, uh, talked about the uh, residential properties, this is just a map to demonstrate to you where the hot commercial properties are in 2023. So roughly a quarter of the properties are deemed hot, roughly 3,200 properties, which has substantially increased from last year because last year there were only like 2,200 properties that were hot. So similarly, by applying the land at targeted averaging, um, the number of properties that have outsized increase in the assessed value has been substantially reduced because of the averaging formula. So what is the tax implication? Again, because of the interplay between the two programs, so we're showing you um, what is the implication of the tax rate under the tax averaging program for residential classes, it will be roughly um, a, a 0.2% increase in the tax rate to compensate for the tax relief provided to the hot properties. And for um, resident, sorry, uh, for light industry and business classes, it just purely from the averaging program, there will be roughly 1.5% increase in the tax rate in order to subsidize the, um, those hot commercial properties. So on top of that, if council agree with um, the pilot development potential relief program, there will be another 1% increase in the tax um, uh, in the tax rate in order to compensate the tax relief provided to those properties that are eligible under the, the pilot development potential relief program. And just to give you a sense, is it really an outsized tax rate increase relative to the previous 10 years? Um, just um, just to give you a sense in terms of the range, um, typically we have been seeing over the last 10 years between, I would say, 1% 1, 1 or 1.5% all the way to 6 7% of the tax rate impact, just even purely applying averaging in past few years. So when we look at, in totality, 2.6% for a commercial, it is not, relatively speaking, it's not very high, just looking at the previous ranges. 
and also want to give you kind of like the magnitude of the tax savings for those eligible properties under the Development Potential Relief Program versus the targeted averaging. Roughly, as I mentioned before, the number of properties that will be eligible for the pilot program will be um, 1,360 pr uh, properties, roughly. And the average tax savings out of this group of properties will be around $3,100 on an annual basis, and the median of it is $2,200. Under the targeted averaging program, 3,200 properties are deemed hot and will be eligible for averaging. The average tax savings is 1,800, which is smaller and lower than the Development Potential Relief Program, and the median tax saving is only $100. So the tax impact for those ineligible light industry and business properties as a result of the two relief program and what they need to contribute more to, to, to pay for the relief, um, for an av uh, the average city tax impact for an ineligible property under the pilot program is roughly $360 on an annual basis, incremental tax, but the median in incremental tax for those ineligible properties is only $50. And under the uh, targeted averaging, um, the average impact is $560 and for the median tax impact, it's only $70. So this concludes my very lengthy presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Lots of information here. So you do have a lot of questions. Uh, Council, you have five minutes to ask questions for of the team members. Are there any questions? So Councilor Kirbyan, please go ahead. Yeah, before I begin, can I move for a second round? Uh, we need a, oh, we don't need a mover. Okay, all in favor say yeah? Yeah. Hey, opposed say nay? Hey, motion carries. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Grace, for the very comprehensive presentation and the Herculean amount of work in six weeks. Appreciate it. I have a number of questions. I think some are going to be simple clarifications. So I'm going to try to whip through them. Um, the first one is respect to what we anticipate for pickup. Um, and I know that this is a pilot um, and people are looking for some relief. There's been advocacy going on for a long time, but I'm looking at recommendation B uh, where it says that properties that fail to provide written directions to city by March 31st, recognizing that it's March the 8th today, so only a few weeks away, will not receive uh, relief under the DPRP. So does that mean, are we going to end up in a situation where my landlord notified one small business, but the neighbor next door didn't? And how are we going to do that outreach? Um, this is a very good question. So what we have done is, um, in I think there was um, a news article just earlier on last week, um, it actually kind of um, flagged um, property owners and also tenants. They should really look at the list of properties that that is attached to our report to see if their address actually appear on it. And then if, if, if the address appear on it, they need to proactively engage their landlord just to make sure that their landlord so is So just to be really clear, somebody's not automatically in this. They have to opt in and their landlord has to notify them and they have to get back to the city by March 31st. Is that right? They meaning whoever needs to certify is actually the property owner. It's not the tenants. Right, but it's like the city's not automatically moving this and your property's automatically in the ones we've identified. Like we would have to hear back from them. So we need to, and, and there's a reason for that. I can actually explain that. We want to make sure that there will be properties that when they certify back, just assume that the case that they say, sorry, our property was actually vacant as of October 31st in the preceding year. I, I they would not be qualified for I, that. And then we need to move them back to the averaging, uh, averaging program. And the averaging, there's a deadline. That's why we are setting end of March. Okay, However, I, I understand. How are we communicating with people to let them know that and to get that? We are, we are pushing out the written um, letters to the property owners. Basically, once council approve it, we will be ready to go end of this week and early next week. We are also engaging our um, um, setting something on the web as well as 311. So um, knowing that, you know, the mailing back and forth, it may take um, much longer. So we want to kind of enable the electronic way of submitting this as well. We're trying to make everything possible in a okay. very kind of short time. I'm going to keep going because I have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. um, so in the comparison that you showed, because sometimes people feel there's going to be winners and losers in this situation, and in the comparison that you showed between the DPRP and the targeted assessment averaging, um, is this a correct reflection back that this implementation of the DRPP in some cases could cost less for businesses than if they're subject to the targeted averaging? This is not necessarily co more costly, because you had that chart that showed under DRPP, uh, a, one business might be paying an additional 360 they're not part of this, and another one might be paying 560 with targeted averaging. So. Um, th basically, that table is just to show that whoever are not eligible for those two programs, this is how much you need to pay more to subsidize the relief. That, that's all it is about. Exactly. So there are businesses that are paying more with target averaging 
that are not necessarily part of it now. So this is a similar, what I'm getting at is mm -hmm. that dependingly, there could be some folks that actually, they may not be part of the program, but they mm -hmm. could actually save potentially. Oh yeah, if, if, yeah, if, if they're not in this program, they could be in the averaging program, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, so because people are always worried, well, if some people pay less than I pay more, but it's not that simple, is what I'm hearing. It's not that simple, yeah. Okay, uh, moving on, why are we including um, the industrial light class when sort of the problem that we're, as you said, that we're solving for was really to provide relief for small businesses, arts and culture, et cetera, so why is the light industrial class five included? Because the light in industry and also business class, they almost sometimes is interchangeable and they sometimes they split class. That's the reason why the province actually include five and six in their legislation and that is the, the provincial criteria. So we just basically use that. However, after this pilot program, if, if council directs staff and say exclude all those light industry, we can definitely do that as well. Okay. Uh, the triple net lease, uh, which is a big thing because it's uh, always been a problem since it gets passed down. So. Just to confirm really clearly in simple terms, if someone participates on this or if they have a triple net lease and their property is eligible and their landlord says yes, savings will automatically get passed down to the tenant based on- Through the contract, so the through the agreement, will, they should. The landlord will not be able to keep the savings if someone has a triple net lease that goes to the tenant. Purely from a tax perspective, yes, but there's nothing to stop them from increasing their rent to call back the savings, but that will be outside of this program. Right, do we expect that? I, 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 I will not speculate. But we also have folks that have long-term leases and rents, right? So there's terms to this. It should be fixed. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to come back on for my next questions. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, thank you Councillor Kirby Young. Councillor Kerr. Thanks. Well, Councillor Kirby Young asked a whole bunch of my questions, so that was great. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going to follow up a, a bit on the triple net lease. Um, and I'm sorry, I haven't sort of... We have to remind me of what the language of it is, but is it basically in those leases that um, the, uh, uh, the the whole amount of the tax gets passed on uh, to the uh, leasee? Okay. Correct. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they basically the being informed part of it uh, makes sure that the renters, the leasees, actually look for that decrease. Is that correct? That that. That is the intent that we're recommending council to include in the bylaw, which is a requirement in order for the property owner to get relief. That's a, that's a, that's a very thoughtful requirement. Mm -hmm. And by the way, thank you for, you take such complicated subjects and make them understandable. So I really appreciate that. Um, uh, one thing we haven't discussed and we normally do at this point in time is that implicate or the impact of our changing land uses. So the plans, et cetera. Are we seeing already the impact of the Broadway plan in terms of hot properties? Um, I, I think this is something that I'd rather kind of maybe leave it with the planning department to look at it. But I have to say at the very start, before we came to council to conclude you know, on the Broadway plan, um, because of the, the DCE, the development contribution expectation, it really helped dampen um, the, I would say the, um, the assessed value kind of um, uh, spikes. So that was a very effective tool, I have to say. And just on top of it, um, city staff has been working with BC assessment and we have been collecting assessed value to keep monitoring those areas on a year over year basis, I think we got like 11 years worth of data to really analyze what is the implication as a result of council policy changes and how does that impact the assessed value um, with the DCE in place. So I mean, that will also inform uh, you know, our policy recommendation to council as well going forward. Um, uh, you would understand uh, better than anyone the distribution of hot properties. Is there anything in particular you can point to in terms of council's decision making, policy changes, et cetera, um, that are influencing the distribution of increased values? I, I would say the, the, the simplest one is kind of number of years ago, that is really classic example, can be door corridor. Single family homes, I remember it was at the height of the market, how many years ago, 2017? Um, there was one single family uh, home, um, I think it was 11 something million dollar asking it was price. 11, it was yeah, over that's what I remember stuck in my head. Yeah. So I, yeah, that's clearly is because of yeah. the plan, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. that was in a land assembly, <laughs> the last one. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, those are my questions. Okay. Hey, thank you, Councillor Carr. Councillor Fry. Thanks, Grace. Uh, this is, I know this represents a ton of, a lot of work and conversations we've been having for some time and, um, and appreciate it. it rep represents years of work and, and new initiatives from the province. Um, but, there's always the big but. Um, 
this is a, 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 up to a maximum of five years. And we know that highest and best use for some of these properties, I mean, we won't see them redeveloped within five years. So we, in five years, we'll probably see many of these particular properties will still be a one-story restaurant in a, in a hot area. What are we looking at five years from now? Do we have thoughts on how we can tame this then? Because this obviously could be a big shock to those businesses mm -hmm. after five years. Yep, this is understandable. And this concern has been flagged. I, I guess what I would suggest is that once we get going with be it a pilot program or a more permanent kind of program, all these kind of feedback and all the observations that we have, we can actually continue to engage the province to see is the, if there's any appetite to either extend um, the, the time limit for whatever, you know, very special circumstances, or they need to maybe look for some other tools. I don't know. But I think, um, yeah, I've been hearing this concern as well. But there's also the flip side of it. If, um, if by council policy or legislation, keep reducing the carrying costs for an unlimited amount of time, in, in a way, it's almost dampening um, the objective and the intent of having community plans and ODP to, to redevelop non-highs and best-use properties, to deliver housing, to deliver job space. So I think we need to kind of balance the two. But um, yeah, we can definitely kind of provide feedback to the province to see if they can consider changing that. So on that note about ODPs and planning, is there potential room to finesse some of our, our, our zoning considerations further to maybe protect some of these sort of assets we'd like to see stick around? Yeah, I... Part of the conversation? Yeah, as I mentioned before, I think that the, the use of the DCEs are very effective. And also, um, the other thing I would say is that, in particular for Broadway, a lot of the additional density is really about rental housing. And, uh, and I think that... Suppose I'm, I'm not a real estate expert, but that would be very different from basically allowing a ton of condos, right? So I mean, the spike shouldn't be that high, but I think I would be more comfortable having the planning department to talk about it. But um, sure. yeah. yeah. And I don't mm -hmm. see planning here today, so that's a conversation for another day. Mm -hmm. um, any special considerations that came out through this work on, on arts and cultural spaces, recognizing they don't have the same even capacity as, as a small business or mm -hmm. ability to write off or any of those kind of things? Certainly that's one of the ones we hear a lot about and mm -hmm. they sort of get lumped in as commercial spaces, but as we know, arts and cultural spaces don't mm -hmm. have that same right. revenue generation potential. Yeah, so um, I would say that, again, it's a pilot program. There are some arts and culture um, spaces that, are, that may not be eligible because of the criteria that was proposed to council in, in the first year. Um, Council can direct staff to kind of look at it or maybe expand it with special uh, um, consideration or criteria. And on top of that, I want to reiterate that for nonprofits in arts and culture, they can actually apply for city grant. So um, this program is not going to be the be all and all. It's not going to basically um, fix all the problems, but it could be one of the tools that council can deploy. So it could be between this program and the grants program to provide relief and assistance as well. Well. Although the grants program, we, we didn't fund about $1.6 million in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in culture shift grants uh, in mm -hmm. this budget. So there, there is going to be a shortfall for that kind of opportunity as mm -hmm. well. Do you think there's any appetite in the province to recognize or distinguish mm -hmm. arts and cultural spaces from within the sort of existing classifications? Has that been part of the conversation with the province at all? Um, it is very difficult. The reason for that is because property assessment is really about the property itself as opposed to the occupier, meaning that a property for, for whatever use, I mean, the occupiers can change year over year. So this year, it may be an arts and culture nonprofit. Next year, it could be someone else. It could be a Starbucks, right? So basically, if that is the case, it's really hard to kind of have a, a specialized a specialized class to say it is arts and culture property class. I'm sure that they have been learning from Ontario because I know that Ontario have a program about um, kind of arts and culture kind of district or something like that. That is a very small scale as I understand it. And I believe provincial staff actually talked to them. They didn't go down that path. So um, that's, that's all I can say for now. Okay. No, that's an interesting tip though that I'll look into about the Ontario approach. Thanks, Grace. Mm -hmm. Really, thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Councillor Fry. Okay, Councillor Joel, myself now. Okay, uh, uh, so first, really thanks Patrice, Chris, and your team for this, uh, for this program. I think a lot of work's behind the scene. So my question is, this is a very complex program, the Development Potential Relief Program. So the calculation is really complicated, you know, with inclusion, exclusion, all those. How do we communicate these cal uh, calculations to the community, especially given a very short timeline right now? We have like three weeks for, before March 31st. 
Yeah. That's our plan. Yeah. So for the eligible properties, um, when they get the tax bill, all they will see basically is that this amount of assessed value will be subject to the normal class five and six rate, and this portion of the value will be subject to the lower tax rate, and then we just kind of calculate this is what you need to pay. And for all other properties, they will just look, they will just see a normal tax bill, but with a rate, with um, the five and six tax rate, which is the rate that they're getting as like any typical tax bill. So I don't believe the communication will be that difficult in terms of how much they need to pay or how much they're saving. Okay, but we need to explain the rationale, the mm -hmm. reason for this program to all those property owners, right? So right. That's, I imagine that's a lot of communication to uh, explain that. Yeah, I think, I think all I can say is that because the, the timing has been very squished, so we haven't come up with like exactly like how we're going to communicate that. And I think we try to lay out a, a bit clearer in the PowerPoint presentation. But we, um, once we finish mailing out orders for notification to just really um, start rolling out the certification process, we will look at putting something on our web page to kind of explain that. So that is a work in progress. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. The second question is, have we engaged BIA and um, Board of Trade, the business community, to collect their feedback mm -hmm. for this program? Um, no, um, as indicated in the, in the report, uh, we have been in, I would say, semi-regular, um, up, uh, providing semi-regular update to them ever since the, um, ever since the, the legislation was, uh, came into effect in November 2022. What we told them is that staff at, like we will be doing our utmost best to try to find something that may be implementable in 2023. And then we just kind of kept updating them where we are at, that kind of thing. And we have been very transparent saying that because we only have like six weeks, um, it is a trade-off between how much engagement on the program design versus getting something in front of council for consideration in 2023. So they understood it. Um, and we even gave them a high level kind of thinking in terms of what potentially could be excluded versus included. So we have been quite transparent on that, but did we engage them? What is the implication for those exclusion and this and that? No, we didn't because um, time just didn't allow it. Okay, thanks. So then moving forward, do we have an engagement plan for the business community? Absolutely. Um, in the recommendation, we specifically said that Council, please direct staff to have a full-blown engagement with our stakeholders to really assess the efficacy of this pilot program. For sure, we must have missed something because of the high-level kind of like thinking about criteria. For sure, we, we might have included some, some properties that we shouldn't have, or maybe we have excluded some properties that we shouldn't have excluded. So we fully intend to engage the stakeholders to really make next year's program a lot better. And that, that is our commitment. Okay, thank you. My last question is, out of those 1,360 eligible properties, do we know how many are tenants, how many, you know, operate on their own business? Do we know? No, we, we don't. We can actually get the information from BC Assessment. Um, yeah. And, and that will be very good information that hopefully in the future we can actually analyze more so that council can further decide um, who you want to focus your, your relief as well, but likely not for first year. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Grace. That's all my question. Uh, Councillor Meisner, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Grace, for all the work on this. I know it's uh, super complicated. Um, I was actually going to ask a question similar to Councillor Joe's question they just asked about uh, the properties. So we don't know if there is an independent business, for example, in those properties. Are we? Do we know that information? Uh, we actually did sample tests. Um, I indicated in the report that in addition to relying purely on BC assessments data and uh, the, the use code, <laughs> I keep saying that my, my team became best friend of Google Maps and Van Maps. <laughs> Basically, we actually did um, quite a number of um, sample uh, properties in check to see like were they um, what are the businesses basically on site? Okay. You know, whether they were um, uh, vacant or not, you know, last year. But again, we couldn't, we cannot do a hundred percent of testing. That's why we only did on a sample basis. That's the reason why in the declaration process, we also want mm -hmm. the property owners to certify that they do not belong to any of those exclusions. Okay, but the use code doesn't specify between, say, like McDonald's and a local cookware no. shop. No, that 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 is the challenge. That's why we we spend like hours and hours to on to, Google Maps. Yes. Van maps as well. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully those are updated maps. Uh, <laughs> sometimes they can be old. Yeah. Um, okay. Good to know. And then are there any learnings around unintended consequences that we've seen in other jurisdictions or is that not possible because this is a new... It is new, and in, in fact, I would say that other municipalities are trying to look at us to look at unintended consequences okay. before they even start doing anything, so, yeah. Okay, so we're the guinea pig. I also noticed that a lot of automobile-related things are excluded, and I understand uh, why that would be, but I guess I have a question around, say, like, 
small mechanic shops mm -hmm. for car service. So I'm not mm -hmm. talking about like the massive Canadian tire with the auto bays, mm -hmm. talking about like your independent mechanic that has a small building. Mm -hmm. They would be excluded as well under this, correct? In the pilot, yes, because we really couldn't get into the property by property to, to, to search, like, is it really Mercedes and BMWs, sub, like, part service versus some independent ones? So this is something that we fully intend to really look into um, um, for, for the next year. Okay, mm -hmm. that's great. Um, and then uh, other question was, uh, going back to BIAs, are you going to be reaching out to the BIAs between now and March 31st to remind them to remind their members that they need to apply for this? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. that's great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Masner. Councillor Boyle. Thanks. Uh, and I will just echo a huge thank you, Grace. You have uh, communicated this super clearly, and I know the team has worked very hard on it for a very long time. So thank you. Uh, I have a few kind of clarifying questions. Um, you said most uh, tenants on triple net leases will see this passed along, but it may, but we can't require a landlord if they figure out how to add it in some other way. Are we, do we have any way to be able to track that so that if a, if a landlord isn't passing the savings along to the business, we could um, not include them in the program in a future year? Um, I'm not sure from a legislative and authority perspective, but I'm just reacting to this question. I think one way of doing it, we could potentially go through the BIAs and have them survey their, their members. Okay. So I think that would be a good piece of information that we can actually maybe partner with the BIAs to see if they can help as well. A sense of that. Mm -hmm. Not all businesses are part of BIAs, but we could get a sense. Yeah, that mm -hmm. um, thought. Uh, okay, also curious. Um, you mentioned that we will send out information to property owners to have them apply. Are we sending information as well to business owners to get them to nudge their landlords to apply? Sorry, ju just to clarify, we're not asking people to apply. Okay. What we're saying is that the list of properties that meet the city criteria, we will be sending them the written declaration saying that declare all these yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, and send it to us. Only if we do not get the, affirm, the, the affirmation that they fulfill those, then they will be not eligible. So basically, it is not an application process. We just want to get, get the, the declaration. So I'm um, answering your question. Um, we will be sending to the property owner because all these should be fulfilled, uh, filled out by the, the property owners. However, I, I have to believe that the BIAs, and we will work with them, just to notify you know, their, their members, in particular those tenants, to really urge their property owner to really certify that before end of uh, uh, March 31st. And we will make sure that it's not going to be entirely a paper-based thing. We need to send out the paper written certification. However, we're going to set up electronic means so that people can actually kind of faster in response so that you don't need to wait for, you know, the, 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 the post station, that kind of thing. Are we able to send a, a similar piece of mail to the business owner at those addresses as well that says, remind your landlord to fill out this form? I, I'm just conscious of it. Mm -hmm. If it's going to that business address, it's addressed to the landlord, it gets lost, it's the, mm -hmm. it's the small business owner and, and mm -hmm. lots of them aren't in BIAs still across the city? We can definitely look into that. And at the minimum, we will definitely, like through the BIAs, alert them, understanding that not all businesses belong to a BIA, but I hope that it will have quite, I would say, a, a wide um, coverage as well. But we will look into it. Okay, great. Thank you, Thank you for that. Um, uh, one more question. Um, how am I doing on time? Uh, on slide 34, and again, forgive me if you covered this, I, and I, I just want to make sure I understand it properly, but... You said, based on the um, amounts and criteria staff have laid out, uh, everyone else would be paying about 1% more. That's mostly businesses. It's a 0.2% on residents of an increase. Is that... Um, so uh, two different things. The the 0.2 percent from the residents, the rest um, on the residential side, they're only paying into the land assessment averaging for for the residential property. Okay. There, there's no interclass of tax shift whatsoever. Okay, yeah. got it. So the the shift would just be within um, right. business classes, and it would be those non-eligible businesses, big box businesses, banks, etc., who would be paying slightly more for the 
this decrease for small and independent businesses. Correct. Okay. Uh, great. Those are all of my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Councillor Clausen. Kirby Young is next, I think. Oh, I think the second second round. You, we're going to go first round first. Very good. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, uh, just let me add, add my voice to uh, to the others who are acknowledging uh, the significant amount of uh, work, and uh, I, I would argue some uh, real creative thinking that went into uh, developing this policy. Um, these uh, types of uh, the attempt to try and bring relief uh, to this class of business and commercial has been longstanding. Um, and uh, while the policy, uh, there's never probably going to be a perfect policy, uh, this one is likely um, to uh, have some uh, ripple effects within within the community. Um, we are uh, uh, positioning this as a pilot, um, uh, but presumably that once you, you start giving uh, a business as a tax break, it's very hard to take it away. So I guess what I wanted to know is more around staff capacity. Um, to evaluate as we go through the year um, and being able to come back to, to council with sort of recommendations on how we fine-tune this. Mm -hmm. In terms of staff capacity to do this, it is important enough and we will allocate staff resources to do it. And to be really honest, I have to thank my team. It is nonstop 24-7 almost um, um, for the last six weeks. And because it's important enough that we believe that we need to get it going. Um, so in terms of... Um, the future enhancement opportunities, if there are areas that council really wants staff to focus on in terms of areas that you may think that maybe we need to kind of look into it, let us know when we can actually prioritize and when we engage stakeholders, we also want to be a more, have a more focused discussion as opposed to like blue skying. Um, I think that will be helpful for us as well so that we can actually dedicate the resources needed to make it work. Um, and, and I know that um, very likely council are going to hear from the community, from business operators and BIAs and, and uh, other groups. Um, there, through the creation of this policy, there, there clearly are some, if you like, winners and losers. Mm -hmm. um, do, we, um, uh, do we have a plan to try and evaluate, uh, again, those uh, potential losers and see if they might be sort of drawn into um, uh, into the this uh, this DPRP or whatever it winds up becoming um, uh, throughout this uh, this pilot period I, I think there 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 is an opportunity the reason why I say that is because um, not all pro how do I say that there are properties that have development potential challenges that are excluded from the city criteria because of the city criteria for the pilot um, year. So I think those will be the properties that we want to look harder into, uh, in particular those that are not like big boxes or, or chain stores, but some, as I think as mentioned before, some independent kind of mechanic shops. Maybe those are areas that we can actually look into to bring them under this program. And then at that time, I would just kind of emphasize that that it will be a trade-off and a discussion uh, with, with council to really understand the more people get into, or the more properties get into this program, the impact to the rest of the properties that have to pay for this relief will be higher. So there's always a trade-off, but that is a policy discussion and trade-off um, that should exist within council, and it's a policy question, it's not an assessment question. Of course. All right, thank you. That's my questions, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Clausen. Councillor Corbiel. Uh, thanks, Chair. I have a follow-up question. I just want to be really clear in terms of the decision that Council is being asked to make today. Um, and that is that this is, in terms of the time frame, this is for the 2023 tax year. Um, but Council will be required uh, to make a decision for the 2024 tax year based on the information that comes back as to whether or not we want to continue. Is that correct? Yeah, this is on an annual basis. Well, what, you, what, what you're asked to approve is just for 2023. And 2024 will be another process. Okay, and to staff, uh, and recognizing that we're kind of breaking new ground here uh, to some of the earlier comments, is sort of staff view that uh, we could have a range of approaches. We could have an affirmation that this program makes sense. We could have a, yes, it's good, but we need to tweak it, or we could potentially have a recommendation that says we, we don't think that the pros outweigh the cons. Mm -hmm. So are we kind of wide open in our thinking as to whether or not this would be something that we would be continuing? My sense is that this is something that key stakeholders in the community, they have been looking for it, and we did get the legislation from the province to get it done. I think the majority of the question would be who is in and who is out and who determined the criteria and, 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 and are, are there 
enough engagement to really understand and hear from both sides of, of the equation. I think that will be probably the feedback um, that will feed into next year. I, I personally don't see it to be going away. But one thing I want to kind of maybe alert council is that um, only the city of Vancouver has been using land assessment averaging um, you know, uh, among all the BC municipalities. If going forward, Council can also have a choice saying that instead of having like two very kind of complicated programs, all the interfaces and whatever, maybe focus the tax relief to tackle development potential, maybe phase out land assessment averaging, that is also, that could be considered as well. And that will also inform what the future of the development potential relief program could look like, right? So I think, yeah, all these are kind of like, I would say multi-dimensional kind of review that we can actually bring back to council. Okay, so this is, if I can reflect that back, this is potentially taking us in a direction that we are becoming more surgical in our application of tax policy, really lasering it on where some of the challenges are as best we can? Absolutely. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, and I'm not seeing anybody else in the queue. I'm happy to move the recommendations. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carbiel. Okay. Uh, seeing no other question on the queue, thank you so much, Chris and the team, for, the, uh, for this uh, program. Uh, we will now hear from the public. We have to hear from the public, yeah. We will now hear from the registered public speakers uh, for this item. The first one is uh, Yaro Yunis. Sorry for mispronouncing your, your name if I did. So, is y y Yaro, are you on the line? Hi, yes, can you hear me? Hey, please go ahead, you have five minutes. Hello? Thank you. Uh, good morning, Council. My name is Yaro Yunis, and I'm the economist for Western Canada at the Canadian Federation of Independent Business the country's largest small business association representing and voicing the interest of 97,000 small businesses in Canada, including 9,400 here in BC. I would like to start by commending city staff for really acknowledging the challenges. Sorry, yeah, no, sorry to interrupt you. Sorry, so I think people are having some hard time to hear you. Can you speak louder, please? Oh, so, yeah, we'll maybe come closer to your speaker. It's a little bit muffled here. Hello, Yaros? Can you hear us? Hello, are you on the line? Oh, okay, he's disconnected. So I guess we can go to the second one and come back later, hey? Okay. Just one second, everyone. Okay. Yaro, uh, you, you, you're back on the line, right? Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, I just wanted to yeah, start by. Yeah, sorry. I, I just wanted to start by by commending city staff for really acknowledging all the challenges faced by small independent businesses in Vancouver that are affected by development potential taxation and all the hard work they've done in creating this pilot program. We also really appreciate the very transparent engagement we've had from city staff on this issue. And we understand that this is a very complex topic. And the proposal put forward by staff, we think, is a good first step towards finding a solution. Um, however, we do have some concerns with the pilot program, some that have been addressed by counselors with their questions. First, uh, the cost of the development potential relief uh, provided to some businesses will be borne by properties within the same commercial property class meaning that some businesses will have to pay more so others can receive financial relief. Uh, this is a big cause for concern, especially in the context of the city's 10.7 property tax hike. Um, this hike, coupled with inflation, labor shortages, and slower economic activity is sustainable moving forward and will affect some small businesses. Um, it is also important to note that commercial properties account for only 19% of total property assessment value, but they pay 40% of all property taxes. Uh, they also face a property tax rate almost 3.4 times higher than residents. So, and despite the recent tax shift, uh, the current property tax distribution in Vancouver, as I mentioned, remains uh, you know, balanced. So to ensure a fair and balanced approach that benefits small businesses and the larger community, we believe council should review the current property tax distribution and do another tax shift, not only to alleviate the burden, but to also complement this relief program that's being proposed today. Um, our second concern with the pilot program is that the criteria used to provide relief might appear to be a bit high level, a bit subjective, but that's due to a lack of clear and incomplete and complete data from BC assessment. Uh, this might result in some properties not getting the relief they need, and it's, it's quite a concern. This, these concerns also stem from the fact that the province provided municipalities with this legal tool to Bill 28 to provide property tax relief to businesses, but really failed to offer 
adequate administrative support and necessary resources to, to successfully implement this policy. And that's something we have heard from several other municipalities that want that really want to provide property tax relief for businesses, but really can't because they don't have the resources or they don't have the operational capacity to do it. And they are also concerned uh, about BC assessment data limitations. But overall, the pilot program is a good first step in providing solutions to skyrocketing property tax bill. And we understand that the quick rollout of this program, given the, the, squeeze, the squeeze timeline, will not be smooth, and that some businesses will be left out. But we also know and acknowledge that some relief is better than no relief. So moving forward, we believe it is very important that the city continues open and transparent engagement about about how the implementation of the program is going. It is critical that 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 city staff continues consultation with the business community, as this is key to ensure the city receives very valuable insights and feedback on what is working, what is not, and um, and how to improve the program. Thank you for your time and, and consideration. Thank you, Yaro. Thank you for speaking to council. Seeing no other question, we're going to move to the second one. Second one is uh, David Van Hammen. Uh, David, is, are you on the line? I am, yes. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, go ahead, David. Okay. My name is, uh, as said, my name is David Van Hemmen, and I'm representing the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade. Today I'm speaking in, in favor of targeted land assessment averaging recommendations F through I and seeking that council instruct staff to delay a decision on the implementation of the proposed development potential relief pilot in favor of additional consultations. Uh, but first, I wanted to, to start my remarks by recognizing International Women's Day. We're so fortunate um, to have the benefit of fantastic uh, women leaders in the city and in the chamber today. And as a father of three daughters, I'm, I'm proud to be able to celebrate our political leaders, all the staff at, at City Hall and women throughout the city. It's, a, it's an honor today to lift up women and, and to say thank you. Um, with regards to the presentation today, I also wanted to thank staff for the work and advocacy at various tables over the years regarding the challenges faced by businesses being unfairly taxed by development potential. Specifically, that many businesses are being taxed at the commercial rate for that potential, uh, for, for uh, residential uh, potential. Uh, we're also understanding of the fact that staff have worked diligently following the passage of that provincial legislation to pull together the solution uh, before council today. And, and also, as Yarrow mentioned, that the city is working under those new legislative parameters, not the original solution that was put forward by, by staff collectively uh, with stakeholders. Um, our concern in asking for the delay is that the proposal appears to stray uh, too far from the initial challenges and ends up choosing some very specific winners and losers instead of a principles-based approach that we had endorsed in the past. In effect, the pilot proposed is making decisions and value judgments to figure out which businesses should benefit or not, um, and we think that that could have some negative consequences for a, a good portion of our members. I do think it's instructive that nearly one-third of the properties in Class 5 and 6 were deemed eligible under provincial legislation, 3,400 of them, uh, but only 1,361 are being offered relief. Uh, we have many businesses operating uh, throughout the city in, in office buildings and in industrial properties in a variety of different spaces. And we know from the staff report that nearly 200 office buildings uh, that are affected are being excluded. We also know that over 300 industrial buildings are uh, excluded and we don't know the specific reason uh, for why um, all of those properties are being excluded. And many of these office and industrial buildings host important um, and high-tech businesses critical to Vancouver's future, whether it's up-and-coming AI firms, AR, VR companies, or local food processors. Um, many of those will be in office or industrial buildings affected by the same challenge. And at the same time, we've seen since uh, 2009 um, to, to 2019, at least for our analysis, we've seen that kind of average light industrial tax rates have grown by 148%, or sorry, total tax rates have have grown by 148%, while residential has only grown by 41 And that, um, as you already mentioned, businesses continue to pay a disproportionate percentage of, of taxes uh, compared to uh, services provided. Um, we also know that the, re uh, that the relief um, um, provided will come at a difficult time for the rest of uh, uh, businesses operating in Class 5 and 6 
um, at a time when property taxes, property taxes are rising substantially, and the net effect would, would push already a very high tax year uh, to, to around 12% for the rest of businesses. That's why we think um, if and when relief is offered, it should be very clear that it's on a very fair basis, um, and it's very clear which um, um, who's going to benefit and who's not. Um, I also believe that there's not enough time to fully assess whether or not the provincial rule of, of the 95% land value put in place is the appropriate approach to collectively solve the issue that we've been working on together. For example, this approach could provide a disincentive to invest and upkeep in the upkeep and maintenance um, of a particular independent build, uh, business or building. Um, and just finally, I want to be clear that I'm very sympathetic uh, to, to the work that staff's being done and, of course, to our wonderful and important independent um, and SME businesses, uh, hundreds or if not thousands that we represent um, as well in our membership. And, and there are so many that have been act impacted negatively by COVID and lower foot traffic on retail streets uh, specifically. But at the same time, I think it's, um, as, as we look to move forward, it's important that the process be fair and that it works to solve the problem that we've initially agreed on I was there to begin with. So thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you, David. You are right on time. Thank you so much. Uh, you do have a couple of questions. Councillor Kerbion, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks, David, for being here. It's a really important conversation. Um, I just want to pick up on a couple of things that you said, um, and a lot of what you suggested, I think, um, you said, for example, it only affects 1,300 um, properties, 3,400 had been excluded, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm wondering if you f sort of would, how you'd feel that, um, based on what you've heard today, and I assume you've been listening to the presentation, that a number of those things will uh, be worked out throughout the consultation, so it could potentially have broader application, that this is sort of starting small, if you will. Um, so that's sort of the first part of the question. And the other one is, I wonder if you heard the comment or saw the slide with respects to this would have potentially a negligible impact relative to, say, the impact that targeted land averaging has, right? When you look at the actual cost impact of that for folks that are part of targeted land averaging that are not, you actually see, yes, there's an impact for folks that are part of this pilot program um, or not, but it appears to be less than the targeted land averaging. So I wonder if you can comment on those two things. Sure. Thanks very much for the question. I, maybe I'd, uh, to, to your second question first, I would say that, you know, 1% increase on top of, you know, 10.7% uh, for for those that are excluded is still a significant, you know, it's 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 a 10% increase of on top of another 10% increase. So I'd say that first, and then and then second, I am sympathetic to um, you know trying to start and then see who could be in or out of the tent. But the the challenge with that, I think, is is you're still choosing um, which which businesses um, you would prefer to be in or out, as opposed to a principles-based approach to say, okay, we don't think it's fair that the pizza shop on West 4th, the air above, is taxed as as um, as commercial um, instead of the residential potential, whereas that, that's kind of a fairness principle that can apply uh, to all properties, whereas this approach, I think, has merit and we're sympathetic to many of the beneficiaries, but it's hard to know what where that line would be and, and how you would make those value judgments on on um, who should be in that or who should be out of that. Okay, maybe I can jump in with one other question because I appreciate your comments and I think staff are trying to do that work from what I've heard, like excluding the obvious folks like Big Box and Gas. But my other question is really is like, do you have a perspective? What's the value of keeping those small businesses, uh, you know, in downtown or in our neighborhoods like the arts and culture or the restaurants, like if we lose them. Um, and I appreciate like everybody suffering from a tax burden, but we're obviously trying to provide some pretty targeted relief here. But from the Board of Trade's perspective, how important are those folks in our economic fabric? Oh, I would say, I'd say they're critical, Councillor. I, I would say that they're critical and all, all businesses have a critical role in, in, um, in, and some do more than others, but in, in the fabric of our community. I think it's critical. I think for, for, for me, the challenge is you know, if you're on West 4th and your building is worth $300,000, but next door your building is worth $190,000, and the one that's the building's worth $300,000 gets zero benefit and, in, in fact, has to pay, and the other building, you know, gets the benefit, that's a tricky trade-off that I think needs Sorry, to be carefully managed. David, we, are, so, 
running out of time here, but you do have another question. Okay, Councillor Fry. Hi, David. Um, so just, yeah, and I, and, and, and I appreciate some of the, the nuance of what you're suggesting and, and talking about. I mean, it is also highly complicated by the fact that, that this is provincial legislation that we're working with and we have limited tools at our disposal. So when you, you sort of mentioned the, the, the 3,400 versus the 1,300, I mean, even if we were to sort of expand the parameter and, and, and insulate those 3,400, it would still kind of come off the backs of the rest of your members, no? Uh, so, so absolutely that's true, and I totally appreciate that it's under the provincial parameters. I think f from our perspective, that's why we had sought a fix on ensuring that the airspace was not taxed as commercial if indeed it was residential and, and that, um, that BC assessment was doing a better job and actually um, um, providing an accurate assessment of development potential or not rather than trying to, like we're doing today, trying to pick winners and losers and who should be in the tent, if that answers your question. I guess so, but this, this I mean, I think, I just want to get a sense of if we're, if this is still better than the status quo for you, yeah? I would say that we're not yet prepared to say it would be better than the status quo and that we would anticipate that there may be, you know, a large administrative challenge with the operations of the program and there could be many businesses that are, you know, are, are wondering why they're out or why they're in and, and um, there may be a lot of people on the line that might not benefit and so I think we're not yet willing to say we appreciate the effort but we're not yet willing to say that this would be um, substantially, substantially better than the status quo even though we're sympathetic to the small businesses that would be getting relief. Okay, but you're not saying don't go ahead. Uh, we, we are saying, we're saying delay a year and do a proper and fulsome consultation um, would be our preference. And not, not pilot it out as we do right now and then, and then use that as our next year consultation? I mean, there's a lot of work that's gone into this and there's a lot of folks who are also desperate for any kind of relief, certainly in some of the hot zones that we've identified. Yeah, so our preference would be to, to, to not move forward now and to do a consultation so we can know more definitively who, who would be in the tent and who wouldn't. Okay. Thanks, David. I'm out of time, really. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Fry. Uh, seeing no other per, uh, council on the queue, we're going to move on to the, uh, the next speaker. Thank you, David. Thank you for speaking at the council. Uh, the next one will be, uh, is Heidi Taylor. Is Heidi on the line? Yes. Good morning. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Please go ahead, Heidi. Thank you. Um, thank you, Your Worship Council members. My name is Heidi Taylor. I'm the secretary to the board of C-Space. We're a performance production space, one of those arts organizations that has been thriving for 14 years on William Street, just off Clark Drive in Kamkamalai. My position on the report is in favor with reservations. C-Space, in collaboration with other arts organizations, has been advocating directly with multiple departments at the city and the province for property tax reform, particularly in the past two years. But there are reports dating back to 2019, both internal to the city and from the not-for-profit sector, that have identified tax policy as a critical piece of cultural sustainability. It's a complex balancing act, and I'd like to recognize the scale of the issue that finance is addressing with this report and uh, share the um, uh, accolades for the work that the done. However, the current Central Relief Program, um, from analysis by our colleague, colleagues at the Eastside Arts Society, offers relief to fewer than 10 arts organizations within the proposed Eastside Arts District. Um, two of those organizations are art studios. So this is out of 1,300 plus eligible properties. So we asked finance why our warehouse space um, isn't eligible despite apparently meeting the criteria and received the response that um, we just don't fit the use code uh, because of what's been assigned by BC assessment. So there's no clear on-ramp to inclusion in the policy being offered, whether we need our use code to be changed or whether our use code will eventually be included in the future. I realized that this uh, policy had to be developed under short timelines, but what it looks like is that um, the continued reliance on highest best use as a foundation is failing to address the need to 
include social value. So uh, we've heard today that every single underdeveloped property will be developed eventually. So does that mean that every arts organization in a warehouse in East Van should be planning to leave the neighbourhood? Um, I'd like to thank Councillor Fry for mentioning the challenges of both the timescale of the policy and the impact on arts and culture spaces. We really need to ensure that arts and culture spaces aren't forgotten when policies are being drafted from the beginning. So the, re the report suggests reviewing the efficacy of the policy for future years and consulting with community partners. But arts and culture organizations aren't community partners. We're also employers, workers, and engines for the local economy. So we need to take the future of the cultural sector seriously in the first round of policy development, not as an afterthought. Um, the province, uh, the program it currently is deferring the responsibility for the affordability crisis to the hardworking team at Cultural Services, who are distributing grants that don't even cover our property taxes. Last year, C-Space received $26,500 in support. We were really grateful for that. We paid $29,500 in taxes. We're an arts organization with a budget under $300,000. And we're only one in the hundreds of organizations in the city and the hundreds of arts organizations in our neighborhood. I'd just like to point out there's an HR cost for the city to administer grants for us to pay property taxes. Um, the program doesn't address the urgent needs of arts and culture. Um, or individual artists who are in commercial triple net leases. And um, cultural services has been talking to finance about the way in which arts organizations are being left behind. So the answer that we can apply for grants is really inadequate and doesn't address the many policy recommendations that have come through in cultural reports over the last four years. We really are committed to working with finance to develop a triage, hopefully for this year, and an articulated plan for the future, but the city really has to integrate its strategies between taxation policy, zoning, and cultural funding if you want to ensure the survival, particularly of arts production spaces in the city, which can't be tied to um, residential uh, property development. So um, I'm requesting that C-Space and other Keystone cultural organizations like the Eastside Arts Society, whose buildings were excluded from this program, be considered for relief in this pilot year so that when there is data to review as the program is developed, um, it won't just be data recognizing the loss of more cultural spaces in our community. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Okay. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you for speaking at the Council. Uh, I think, you know, because of the time, we need a motion to pass 12 p.m. to finish this item. Also, reconvene at council to deal with the recommendation today. Uh, so, mo move by Councillor Boyle. Motion to, so yeah. Okay. And now, I think this is end of this. And move oh. the, rec move the <laughs> recommendation. Oh, in favor, say yeah. 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 Opposed, say nay. <laughs> okay, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, so this is the end of our speaker's list. Thank you, everyone, for speaking to the council. Would someone like to move a motion? So moved. Councillor kirby Young. Moved by, moved by Councillor kirby Young. Council, is there any discussion? Councillor kirby Young, please go ahead. Right. Okay, so Councillor kirby Young, can you add your, uh, can we add Councillor kirby Young to the main queue, please? Okay, please go ahead, Councillor kirby Young. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, this is a really important conversation, and um, this council and the council, uh, or the last council, I should say, and then the council before that, has been advocating longstanding for tax relief uh, to address the issue specifically of the highest and best use, um, and specifically the most impacted, um, which are the small businesses, typically the independents and arts and culture groups and others. Um, and we, I think we have to remember that the province did bring forward an interim solution and not a single city or municipality took that up, including Vancouver, um, because it was onerous and it didn't really address the problem that we were trying to solve. Now we have sort of a second kick at the can, if you will, where after years of advocacy, the province has come forward with an, uh, this additional opportunity um, in front of us, and it, in a very record short period of time, granted, um, and it may not be perfect in the application, however, um, it does provide some relief. I think we heard some speakers say some relief is better than none. It is very tricky in working and parsing through um, tax relief programs um, and the issue here. But I think when I take a step back and think about the issue we're trying to solve for, which were the sort of famous stories like chocolate mousse um, and others, 
groups like the Beaumont Art Studios, small restaurants in Marple. We saw some examples of those that are really feeling that development pressure around them. This is a way that we can bring some tangible relief forward, I think, to those that need it most. I'm very sensitive to the comments, and it's very difficult when you're dealing with complex and interrelated tax policy and not having all the, the um, all these sort of outcomes and the known pieces around that. Uh, and I'm very sensitive as a result of that to the comments that we don't have all of the information about all of the properties and that can make people nervous um, and we want to be supportive of our entire business community. Um, but I also think to the comments that you are only addressing the 1,300 so 60 properties here, that's 1,360 that didn't have relief before. Um, and I think it, I view it as progressive improvement. And I do think that during the engagement process, which I fully believe staff are going to undertake um, to have some really meaningful conversations, whether it, across a range of stakeholders, whether it's with the Board of Trade, um, with the BIAs and others that we have heard, um, that this is an initial iteration of this program. And I think I fully expect that it will be uh, refined and implemented over time, and we will learn a lot from that implementation. But sometimes I think you have to kind of remember you can wait to make something perfect and try to figure out all the eventualities, or you can try to make it better now um, and strive to improve upon that moving forward. And sort of reminds me of the status quo is not an option. When I look at examples like a restaurant in Marple that might save $7,200, um, or things like Treble 5 music uh, in Mount Pleasant that could save $12,500. We are rapidly losing um, a number of these arts and culture groups and the restaurants in the city. Really sensitive to some of the speakers that we heard, um, such as Heidi from Sea Space, that not everybody may be captured. Um, but there are different avenues. But again, do we want to not help some because we haven't made this perfect? I don't think so. Um, I'm comforted by the fact that everybody is going to receive their notices. So it's sort of less of an opt-in program. It's you will receive the information and then you will need to complete your declaration. Um, so I think that's important. I also think um, that it was important to clarify that with triple net leases, um, the savings will be passed down. Uh, to tenants because they're required to do that by law and no landlords because tenants are typically in multi-year leases cannot tomorrow suddenly adjust their rents. Um, and so I think again, if we see that there might be a couple of bad actors that are trying to do that, that's what will work out um, and through the process in terms of looking at some of those details. Um, and I think too, um, I thought it was very illuminating to look at the examples of how the contrast between if you're a business and you are not part of targeted land averaging, for example, how are you impacted? because you are supporting the rest of the businesses in your class and paying a little bit more. And if you are a business that is part of the DPRP um, and you're not part of it, how are you impacted? And the DRPP could result in some folks actually paying less. And so again, taxation is complex. It's a lot of information. I understand that um, there's going to be a lot to learn through this, but I do think it's important that we take some action to provide some relief moving forward. And I think that this is not set in stone. Um, as we said earlier, council can refine it in 2024, uh, we can not continue it, um, or we can move forward if we find that it's hitting the mark. But I, my sense is that there's still going to be some additional work to do, but this is an improvement over what we have now um, based on the biggest need and, and the folks, and something that we've quite frankly long been advocating for. Um, and I'm really grateful to staff for their work on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Corbiel. Councillor Boyle. Thanks. I actually am hoping to ask a question through you, Chair, to staff, which is I'm wondering if we can just hear a bit more about what engagement um, can and will happen in the next year, particularly with the arts and culture sector, uh, about some of the concerns we heard from the speaker and that we hear regularly about the huge pressure on, the, on that sector. Yes, um, we, we fully intend to um, um include in our like stakeholder engagement, arts and culture, nonprofit, community partners, and also like BIAs and, and, and Board of Trade. The most important thing is, I think we have been hearing loud and clear, not just from the arts and culture, but just simply about the BC assessment data limitation, basically because we rely fully on the use code. I think we need to have a better understanding how do they assign use codes? Are they complete? Are they accurate? Are they updated? So basically that will be the first thing that we need to engage first and foremost. The second thing basically is also to look at the interplay between the grant program as well as um, the relief program, and also between this relief program versus the targeted land assessment averaging. So I will not say that it's a simple thing, but um, I think after we get over this billing cycle, we will start engaging. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and, and as a second question, just confirming our, our own staff in um, arts and culture who, who know this sector well and know the 
players and pressures will be in will they be Absolutely. involved in that conversation for sure yeah Great. appreciate that thank you um i, I will then just uh say i, I am um, grateful for the huge amount of work that was done on this in a short period of time after years of advocacy. Uh, I'm particularly interested in uh, in how we have begun to look at supporting um, or, or giving a break to small and independent businesses and being able to get at the differentiation between those small local businesses and big box stores and um, and multinationals. I think that's an important piece that hopefully we can continue to get more nuanced on in terms of uh, supporting and, and um, seeing uh, thrive those small local businesses that are so often who we hear from or who we hear from residents about in wanting to make sure that they are supported long term um, and that all of the ways that they contribute to their neighborhoods uh, are supported. So glad to see that. Looking forward to the work that we will do to continue to get into that, uh, the specifics of that and learn from the pilot and keep improving it. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Uh, Councillor Klassen. Thank you, Chair. Um, just uh, building upon a little bit of what I've heard from Councillors Kirby Young and Boyle uh, uh, with a few points, just to like to acknowledge uh, the advocacy of council members in the previous term uh, for helping to uh, to get this policy moving forward and as well the provincial government uh, for working with the local government here uh, but with the bill 28 um, we've known about the impact of the highest and best use property assessments and the fees resulting from triple net leases uh, leases and then we know that they've impacted the viability of small and independent businesses businesses um, finding a solution to this complex challenge has clearly taken a lot of time and I appreciate the creativity of our staff in striking a balance and using the policy to narrow down the, the properties that uh, to be included at this for this pilot. Um, I also just uh, want to acknowledge that our small and in independent businesses uh, really must work hard every day to, to make payroll, to benefit their staff, and that it's particularly challenging uh, in this time of inflation and other increasing costs. Uh, so, uh, and, and small and independent businesses are truly the lifeblood of our communities. And as a local government, we must continue to find ways to help them prosper. This policy is another piece in how we can make Vancouver a stronger place for small business. And I look forward to engaging with small businesses, property owners, and as well, small biz business advocates such uh, from our BIAs, uh, Board of Trade, uh, CFIB, and so on. Uh, so I'll be uh, voting in support of this item and we'll continue to monitor and hear what we uh, get from the community uh, during this pilot period. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Clausen. Councillor Fry. Thanks, Chair. Um, again, super appreciative of the work that's gone into this and to Grace and the team and, and, and to the province for uh, some of the work in introducing this legislation that's getting us in the, in the place we need to be getting, but we're not there yet, and, and that's clear. I'll, I will be voting in support of this, and I, I want to acknowledge some of the comments from some of the speakers around some of the frustration around how we have to pick winners and losers and that this is an imperfect tool. But as the old saying goes, we can't let the uh, let perfect be the enemy of the good, and and this is better than nothing for for a lot of a lot of uh, uh, properties that are struggling in our city with with highest and best use. Uh, and in reflecting on the on the past council, this this work that we were this beast we were trying to tame, uh, we were unable to tame, and indeed we saw uh, businesses uh, slip away um, and arts and cultural spaces slip away as a result of unsustainable taxation burdens that they felt. Um, I do also want to really acknowledge the comments of, of Heidi and, and, and that these are reflective of, uh, from uh, C-Space, that just this is the tip of the iceberg for arts and cultural uh, practitioners in our city. Um, hear this all the time from the sector that they are struggling and, 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 and suffering. And we know that, that arts uh, in general, um, we punch way above our weight as a city with, with arts and culture and practitioners, but we also have the lowest paid artists in, in the country. And, and that, that dichotomy is <clears throat> really evident here when we see the, the struggles of arts and cultural practitioners trying to maintain spaces in a city that is 
increasingly difficult to do so. And 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 we've we've certainly given direction in the past around things uh, in the last term with the the East Side Arts uh, District and. And, and looking at how we can better preserve cultural spaces. And I think that this is a big piece of some of the work that needs to go on, uh, that how we can better support. We know that in this last budget round, we had $1.6 million of unfunded uh, uh, for for the, the um, culture shift, which was specifically looking at one of the many things was it was looking at those spaces and, and the desperate need for space for arts and culture practitioners. And I fear that that this is going to be, this is the canary in the coal mine moment as we look look towards how we can sustain such a vibrant part of our, not just creative soul, but actually our, our economy. Um, that said, this is uh, really uh, a lot of work that's gone into getting us here, and it's 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 not perfect, but it's definitely going to make a difference for a lot of a lot of um, properties in our city. So I'm happy to support this and and see this council uh, continue the work that needs to be done to address this moving forward. Okay, thank you, Councillor Fry. All right, so I'm now going to call the vote. Clerk, please take us to the voting screen. Council, please register your vote on the voting panel. Thank you. All right, so this uh, item uh, carried unanimously with uh, Councillor Bly absent. That concludes the last item on the, on the agenda. Thank you, everyone. So this uh, standing committee portion of this meeting is now complete. We will now convene in council with Mayor Singh as the chair to deal with the recommendations and actions from today's standing committee. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Okay, we will now uh, convene in council to deal with the recommendations and actions from today's standing committee on city finance and services meeting. Uh, clerk, may we please have a roll call? Mayor Sim in the chair. Councillor Carr. Councillor Kirby Young. Present. Councillor Dominato. Present. Councillor Bly is on a leave of absence for civic business. Councillor Boyle. Present. Councillor Fry. Councillor Montague. Councillor Klassen. Present. Councillor Meisner. Councillor Joe. Present. You have quorum, Mayor Sim. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we need a motion to adopt the Standing Committee's recommendations for items one through five. I'll move. Great, thank you, Councillor Joe. Seconder. Awesome, thank you, Councillor Carr. Uh, all those in favor say yay. Yay. All those opposed say nay. Great, the motion carries unanimously. And um, would someone like to move a motion to adjourn this meeting? So moved. Uh, thank you, Councillor Klassen. Is there a seconder? Councillor Meisner, thank you very much. All those in favor say yay. Yay. All those opposed say nay. Great, the motion carries unanimously. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.